experiment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, don't worry. Uh, so, uh -huh. okay, so now we are on time, but yeah, we have already number of people. See, I can see in visual. Um, but I wanted to try okay. to get your CV, but uh, I couldn't get anything. <laughs> so, so uh, I can tell you, I can tell people what I know, but uh, my knowledge about you is limited. <laughs> so I tried to connect to some homepage, but somehow, <laughs> Internet, no worries. Time. Yeah, that that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm at CERN right now, so this is the um, yeah, that's the relevant information. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so maybe I think that we are on time. So I think that I hope that more people are coming. But uh, it's better to start our uh, the first lecture of the series today, and the the speaker of the today is the. Uh, Kai Shumis from Sun, and uh, he's going to give us, uh, I think, the in six uh, lectures, uh, one lecture per uh, one and a half, uh, one hour, 15 minutes. And we'll have uh, two lectures uh, for today, and we'll have uh, more uh, tomorrow and the, the day after tomorrow. So I met. Uh, Kai Shumis in Sun and when I was in Sun uh, some time ago. And uh, of course, we knew each other even before that. The Kai Shumis is an expert in cosmology and inflation and uh, electro electrogenesis and etc. And recently, he's uh, working actively on gravitational waves. So uh, we this is a very good chance to hear uh, um, about the update on our effort on the gravitational waves. I think the it's a broad topic, so we we'll, uh, learn a lot from his lectures. Okay, uh, I think that this lecture is the co-organized uh, by uh, Song Chan Park from Yonsei University, and and also Kyung Che. So he is supposed to be here, but I don't see him and and myself. So uh, please welcome Kai. Okay, yeah, so thank you very much uh, for this very nice introduction. And also thank you very much again for the invitation for this great opportunity to give this lecture series uh, to you and all of you here in the audience uh, on gravitational waves. Uh, and as you can see already in the title, I will focus on gravitational waves uh, from the early universe, primordial gravitational waves, uh, because I think they are particularly interesting and uh, promising uh, gravitational waves that we will hopefully learn a lot more about uh, in the coming years and decades. All right, and before I give you an outline of this entire lecture series and what we will cover in the next uh, three days, let me just briefly begin with a short sort of historical uh, introduction. And I want you to take back to the first direct detection of gravitational waves, uh, which is actually not that long ago. This happened. Uh, in uh, 2015, uh, when gravitational waves were observed for the first time directly in interferometers on Earth uh, here in the US in Livingston and Hanford by the LIGO experiment. And these gravitational waves came from or were emitted from merging black holes far out in the universe. Gravitational waves had been uh, predicted uh, almost 100 years, almost exactly 100 years uh, prior to that in 1916 by, uh, by Albert Einstein based on his uh, theory of general relativity. And uh, then pretty much exactly 100 years later in 2016, the LIGO and Virgo collaboration announced the detection of this first gravitational wave event. Uh, this was called GW1509-14 because it occurred or was detected on the 14th of September in 2015, so um, the year before. Um, and in this phenomenal detection, first direct detection of gravitational waves, then also led to the Nobel Prize in Physics the year later in 2017, which was then awarded to three main figures, three main people behind the 
uh, behind this experimental effort, namely to Rainer Weiss, Barry Barish, and Kip Thorne. And well, obviously, the first dark detection of gravitational waves marks uh, an important milestone in fundamental physics and uh, yet another triumphal confirmation of Albert Einstein uh, and general relativity. But besides that, uh, it's also interesting to notice that this first dark detection of gravitational waves at the same time marks the discovery of a new class of astrophysical objects um, that one were only able to speculate about uh, previously, namely the discovery of heavy black holes in binary systems. So this gravitational wave signal we observed from this binary black hole merger was also the first direct confirmation that such systems actually exist in nature. Okay, so this is the um, seminal direct detection of gravitational waves in 2015. Uh, and since then, we have already come uh, a long way. So here, I just want to provide you with an overview of the current status uh, of uh, the gravitational wave experiments on Earth. Um, so this is the set of events that are included in the second gravitational wave transient uh, catalog um, that has been published by the LIGO and Virgo uh, collaboration. Uh, you can find it here on the archive. Uh, and in this latest catalog of gravitational wave events uh, demonstrates the rapid and impressive progress of the entire field since 2015. So now, since the first detection of a binary black hole merger, we have seen in total 50 events that have been observed during um, the first observing run, O1, the second observing run, and the first half of the third observing run, uh, which is uh, commonly called O3A. Okay, so among these 50 events, uh, we see 47 binary, binary black hole mergers. So these are always these pairs of uh, black, uh, sorry, blue circles uh, that merge into uh, a new heavier black hole. And you can find, you can see the masses of these objects here on the vertical axis in units of solar masses. So 47 binary black hole mergers. Uh, and then we observed already two binary neutron star mergers. Uh, you can see them down here. So this orange dot and this one uh, merging together uh, is a neutron star merger and this one here as well. And then uh, the final state of these mergers is marked by a question mark here because it's not entirely clear uh, into what kind of objects these neutron stars uh, merge um, directly uh, after, well, the in spiral and, and the merger. Is it uh, still a highly magnetized neutron star or do they directly merge into a black hole? That's an open question at the moment. Um, there has also been observed the merger of one black hole, uh, this one here, with an unknown object. So here you see another question mark. It could be that this was the first observation of a black hole merging with a neutron star. Um, or it could be another binary black hole merger with a particularly light black hole. So it's, it's not quite clear at the moment whether this, what kind of uh, event this has been. Um, okay, then uh, let me point out two other interesting events here in this uh, chart. So there has been the observation of one primary black hole in the supernova mass gap. This is this black hole up here. You see, this is the heaviest black hole among all these black hole binary mergers. Um, which is the heaviest and in which has a mass uh, above 80 solar masses. So according to the standard supernova theory of black hole formation, um, this binary, sorry, this black hole should actually not exist. Uh, it, it's too heavy uh, and uh, must have some mm, non-trivial or non-standard origin. Maybe it is already the outcome, um, the, um, the end product of a previous merger. Uh, this would be one possible explanation. But yeah, so this is a particularly heavy black hole here in the final state. Uh, and then this event is also interesting because um, the merger of these two black holes has led to this intermediate mass black hole. Um, so again, confirmation for um, a new type of black hole in, in this mass range above the supernova mass gap for, for black holes. Okay, so this is the current status. 
Uh, hello, hello. Yes, hello. there's a question. Sorry, I have one question uh, yes. from your last uh, plot. There's some yellow point. What, what is this? Uh, there are these, okay, these are known neutron stars. Yes, uh, that are known from, if I'm, if I remember correctly, from X-ray observations. Okay, uh, you also see, you see the the yellow dots and you see the purple dots. I mean, these are, um, yeah, uh, known objects, known neutron stars, and then known uh, black holes. Just for comparison, to give you a feeling for which part of the mass distribution we are probing here. Yeah, so you see that. Uh, prior to these gravitational wave observations, we knew these black holes here, the electromagnetic black holes, okay, via electromagnetic observations. And, and now we see black holes in gravitational waves, event, uh, gravitational wave events that are somewhat heavier. And that's an interesting observation, yeah. So um, previously it had not been clear that, uh, well, black holes in this mass range uh, really exist, that they exist in binary systems, but now we know because of the gravitational wave observations. Okay, thank you. Yes, Hello? okay, yeah. Uh, well, is there another one, question? Yeah, I have one simple question. Uh -huh. so, so it's possible to have uh, three objects merging, like three black hole merging. Um, uh, well, I think it, it's not excluded in, in principle. I mean, this has not been observed, and I think uh, it, it, it's very unlikely that all three objects merge at the same time. I think this would require some fine tuning in the dynamics of the system. Uh, but you can certainly have hierarchical merges in the sense that you have a succession of merges. Uh, first, two black holes merge to one black hole, and then the final product merges with a third black hole, and then they merge with a fourth black hole. This can certainly happen. And I mean, such a structure of hierarchical merges um, could also possibly explain the origin of this heavy black hole here with a mass of above 80 solar masses. Let's see. Thank you. Yep. Um, I, I, I have another question. <laughs> OK. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so most of uh, heavy black holes, heavier than 20 solar mass, Yes, uh, they were not identified by EM components, but no. uh, identified only by uh, yes. gravitational wave detection, right? That's right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, these um, black hole binary mergers, they don't give you a counterpart in electromagnetic radiation. Um, that's why we needed gravitational waves to uh, infer their existence in the first place. And as far as I know, I think the only event that had a counterpart in electromagnetic radiation uh, was one of the two neutron star mergers. So either this one here or this one, I don't know which one. Um, and then this actually led to a very extensive follow-up campaign in the electromagnetic spectrum. So as soon as the event had been detected by LIGO and Virgo, some notification was sent out to astronomers uh, around the globe. Uh, and then dozens and dozens of observatories and also satellites uh, turned to the direction of this gravitational wave event to observe the source uh, across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. So this was extremely spectacular, but this has only happened, or this only succeeded so far for one event, which was one of the two neutron star merges. And for the other one, it didn't work. Yeah? So um, the source could not be identified in the sky. Uh, yeah. All right. Um, no, but I think it's, it's great that you're asking so many questions. Uh, we should... Uh, you should keep doing that also during the, the rest of the lecture um, series. Uh, I have one yes. question. Hi, Kai. Uh, um, let me ask a very basic question. But I see uh, some gap between a neutron star distribution and a black hole distribution. And I, I'm wondering if there's something uh, to make this gap between those two distributions. Um, well, mm, I think this is, okay, so this is a selection bias, I would say, in the observations. Um, mm -hmm. So theoretically, you would, you would expect that you also have uh, black holes at, at lower masses, uh, just mm -hmm. a couple of uh, solar masses down here, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, but then this part of the mass distribution is harder to probe because they lead to weaker gravitational wave signals, okay? So uh, mm -hmm. if you switch on your gravitational wave detector uh, at the sensitivity at which you just passed the threshold for detection, you will first mm -hmm. see the more violent uh, events, right? So you will first see the black hole mergers of very heavy black holes because they give you a stronger signal. So mm -hmm. I, to some extent, this is a selection bias because uh, you're more sensitive to the heavier black holes. Uh, 
And then if you want to infer the true underlying mass distribution, you have to uh, account for this effect, right? Um, but, okay, so um, I should move on because otherwise uh, I will not be able to finish, but uh, we can also uh, continue the discussion during the break. Uh, maybe a final comment on your question. Um, in, well, standard black hole formation theory, uh, there's a lower bound on how heavy a black hole how heavy a black hole can be, um, and well, if if uh, the progenitor star is, is just not as heavy, then you will it will collapse into a neutron star, not into a black hole. But the point is that if in the future we can observe a black hole merger, so really a black hole merger with a very light black hole, this would be some indication for the fact that this black hole is of primordial origin. So then you would say this black hole does not originate from stellar evolution, but this black hole must have uh, a, a primordial origin. Uh, obviously, such an event is very hard to detect, uh, but it would be extremely interesting to see a black hole merger uh, down here at very low masses. I see. Okay, uh, yes, I think it's good that we talk about this slide because uh, in the rest of the lecture series, I actually want to focus on gravitational waves from the early universe. And this is one of the very few slides I have on gravitational waves from astrophysical objects. <laughs> and by the way, uh, let me uh, you know, announce that there will be 30 uh, minutes uh, break uh, yes. for coffee. And maybe we can chat over coffee during the yes. information. All right. Yes, yeah, I, I wanted to say this on yeah, uh, in, in two slides or so. Um, but thank you very much for this comment. We will have more time for discussion. Um, but please, if, if there's any urgent question, feel always free to interrupt me and ask. All right, so now I want to take a look into um, the future because I, I just showed to you where we are at right now. Uh, but I would say that we just, they were just at the eve of a new era in astrophysics uh, and in cosmology. And in the future, we will be able to probe a much larger range of the gravitational wave frequency spectrum with more experiments. And we will be able to probe a much larger range of sources, um, including binary mergers, but also beyond binary mergers. And for instance, primordial sources of gravitational waves. And what is exciting about gravitational waves is that they propagate freely after the production through the universe. That means gravitational waves provide us with a new window uh, onto the universe and provide us with information about the sources that uh, produce these gravitational waves all the way uh, up to the very early universe uh, to times that we cannot probe by any other means, uh, in particular, not by means of uh, electromagnetic, electromagnetic radiation uh, because the universe was simply not transparent to radiation at very early times. Okay, so now gravitational waves, they allow us to probe energies far beyond the reach of other experiments and so observations, um, and thus provide us uh, with a window into physics at the highest energy scales and potentially also processes in particle physics at very high energies. So um, I would say the journey has just begun. Gravitational waves will turn into an indispensable tool for astrophysics and cosmology and advance to a primary probe of fundamental physics in the 21st century. And uh, because I think they are so important uh, for fundamental physics in the 21st century, uh, I have been very interested in gravitational waves uh, in the recent years. And that's also why I want to give this lecture series to you to uh, convey you uh, with a sense uh, of the importance of gravitational waves and give you basically um, some starting material to uh, study and then think about gravitational waves yourself. All right, so yeah, after this brief introduction to um, well, the current status of gravitational waves, let me briefly outline um, the structure of this lecture series. So the aim of this lecture series is to highlight some of the exciting new physics that we might be able to discover in the gravitational wave sky. And I want to focus on gravitational waves from the early universe. Um, this is the timetable for our little lecture series. Today, I will talk about um, the theory behind gravitational waves, uh, according to Einstein in linearized, uh, linearized uh, gravity. Uh, and then after the break, so we'll have a break of uh, half an hour. After the break, I will give you an introduction to the basics of gravitational wave experiments. Then tomorrow, 
in the first lecture, I will talk about gravitational waves in standard Big Bang and inflationary cosmology. After the break, we'll turn to gravitational waves from phase transitions. And on Friday, I will talk about gravitational waves from cosmic defects. Uh, and then finally, in the last lecture, uh, give you an overview of current developments. I will mention the nanograph experiment. Uh, if uh, this tells you something, uh, and I will also give you an outlook on the future of the field. Uh, here are some references. Uh, you can also find them on the Indico page that Hyun Min has, has set up. Uh, if there are any other questions, uh, you can always contact me uh, via email. Uh, and a slightly longer version of these lecture notes, of these lecture slides, are also available on Zenodo. So if you want to use some of this information later on, for instance, my email address, I recommend that you take a, a screenshot now press the button for a screenshot, and then you have my email address uh, and this Zenodo address where you can find um, the PDF of these lecture slides. All right. Um, I also have a couple of notation on conventions. This is for later reference. Um, I will work with natural units. I will use this metric signature, uh, and I will use a couple of abbreviations. Um, you can also look this up later if you like, or you can take a screenshot now. I think we but... need to write a book. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I will, yes, this, this will go into the appendix or somewhere somewhere uh, in, in the book, the list of abbreviations. Uh, this is just for completeness, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so uh, if, if you if you want to look up something, some abbreviation. Okay, but now let's, let's turn to the actual physics. Uh, and then here's the outline for the next... Um, yeah, uh, 50 minutes or so, uh, right? Um, I, I want to talk about gravitational waves in linearized uh, uh, gravity, uh, and then talk about the propagation of gravitational waves in the expanding universe. So I will present the equation of motion of gravitational waves, and we will solve this equation of motion in particular limiting cases, um, and then simple cases. Uh, and then after doing that, I will turn to uh, generic backgrounds of cosmological gravitational waves and discuss some of the properties that are common to all sources or to all types of stochastic gravitational waves. And then finally, I will summarize. All right. Um, so let me start with a definition of gravitational waves. Gravitational waves are radiative and gauge invariant tensor perturbations of the space-time metric. Uh, and the purpose of the next couple of minutes will be to break this down and to explain uh, all the individual parts here in this description uh, and tell you what that actually means, what this sentence actually means. So I can tell you now already that radiative means that gravitational waves are dynamical degrees of freedom whose evolution is governed by a wave equation. And we will see this wave equation in a couple of minutes. And gauge invariance refers to the invariance under general coordinate transformations in GR. So general coordinate transformations or uh, diffeomorphism uh, invariance is, is basically the gauge principle underlying general relativity. And um, the gravitational waves in the way in which we will define them, they are actually gauge invariant. So they are physical degrees of freedom that are independent of the choice of your coordinate system. And we will also see this explicitly in a couple of minutes. All right. Um, so let me present you with the first equation of this lecture series. Uh, I want to introduce uh, perturbations of the space-time metric over a fixed and flat Minkowski background. So g mu nu is the space-time metric. Uh, and eta mu nu is just the metric of a flat Minkowski background. Uh, with a signature I showed to you uh, a couple of slides ago, and I want to perturb it by some small perturbations h mu nu, right? Uh, so I require that the components of h mu nu are small compared to the components of the Minkowski matrix, so much smaller than one. Um, and because the metric itself is the symmetric ring two tensor, I can just uh, flip the indices mu and nu here, I can do the same for the metric perturbation so that h mu nu is the same as h nu mu, all right? Um, so a priori, um, h mu nu contains 10 independent components or 10, 
10 functions that I can use to fully specify H menu. And the question now for the next few minutes is uh, how many physical degrees of freedom are actually encoded in these 10 functions that are encoded in H menu? So now we want to count the physical degrees of freedom contained in these metric perturbations. Okay, so I said already that um, the underlying gauge principle of general relativity is the invariance under general coordinate transformations. So we can study the transformation behavior of our metric perturbations. I want to perform a general coordinate transformation going from a coordinate system X to some coordinate system X prime by means of some uh, vector psi mu. Okay, uh, G mu nu is a rank two tensor and then we know the transformation rules under general coordinate transformations of such a tensor. And we can use this to work out how H mu nu behaves under this coordinate transformation. Um, this is a little exercise you can try to do yourself, but the result is shown here in equation two. So now in the new coordinate system, the prime coordinate system, we find a new metric perturbation, which is given by H mu nu. Uh, and, and then these partial derivatives of uh, the psi vector, which parameterizes our coordinate transformation. Uh, and now let's try to see how we can use these general coordinate transformations to remove unphysical degrees of freedom from, from the metric perturbation. And let's see with how many physical degrees of freedom uh, we are left with in the end. All right. So first of all, I want to write down the Einstein tensor. This is the left-hand side of Einstein's field equations to first order in these metric perturbations. So the Einstein tensor is just the Ricci tensor and then the metric multiplying the Ricci scalar. Uh, and you can work it out and then uh, find the expression in terms of the metric perturbations. Here we have H bar. It's not exactly the same as this H. H bar denotes the trace reversed metric perturbation. So if I start with H mu nu, I can subtract this piece here. Uh, H without any index is the trace of my metric perturbation. And if I remove or if I subtract this piece from the metric perturbation, I find H bar, which now has a trace of the opposite sign compared to H mu nu. Uh, and if I introduce this traced, trace reversed metric perturbation, uh, it's just a bit more convenient to write down the Einstein tensor. And I find this expression here, which um, still looks complicated, but um, yeah, is, it is already uh, a slightly more compact compared to what I would obtain if I just use this metric perturbation here. All right, so let's use our coordinate transformation to remove physical, uh, unphysical degrees of freedom. Um, so our trace reversed metric perturbation, H bar, now also transforms under general coordinate transformations. And again, you can work out the result. So now in the new coordinate system with a prime, H bar goes to H bar plus this object here, psi with two indices mu nu, which is given here on the right-hand side. All right. Um, and now I want to well, go one step further. What is the transformation behavior not of H bar, but what is the transformation behavior of the divergence of H bar? So I act with a partial derivative on H bar and I can look at the transformation behavior of, of this object, the divergence of the metric perturbation. And I find, if I combine, if I use the result here in equation five, um, that divergence of H bar goes to divergence of H bar minus box psi mu. And by the way, I should say, uh, here I'm just trying to explain the basic philosophy. Yeah, So the steps that are necessary to uh, arrive at the results I want to present, it's not necessary that you follow all these steps immediately in your head. Yeah? So I would say the relevant information is here on these slides. You can look at them later and try to do these calculations yourself, but don't worry um, that you need to, to really see all the transformations and all the steps immediately on the slides. Uh, just listen to what I say <laughs> and try to follow the basic philosophy of this calculation. Don't try to do the calculation in your head while I'm trying to explain it. All right, um, so now we know how the divergence of H bar transforms. It's this equation here, number six. 
Uh, and now finally we can impose a gauge condition, a condition on our coordinate system so that we can, that, such that we can uh, remove unphysical degrees of freedom. So we use our gauge freedom, our choice of coordinate system to impose the so-called Lorentz gauge condition. So now we can choose our function psi such that this part here on the right-hand side just cancels the other term on the right-hand side. So we basically solve this wave equation for psi such that in our new coordinate system, um, the right-hand side turns into zero. And whenever the divergence of h bar vanishes, whenever this is satisfied, uh, we are in a coordinate system that satisfies this Lorentz gauge condition. Um, and this is very analogous to what happens in electrodynamics. So maybe you're familiar with the same story in electrodynamics. Um, there, you can also require that the divergence of your vector potential uh, vanishes. And this is called the Lorentz gauge. Lorentz without a T. So this is very confusing. Um, in electrodynamics, this has, I think it has been proposed by Lorentz uh, without a T uh, himself. And, and that's why it's um, correct to refer to this as Lorentz gauge in electrodynamics. Here in general relativity, this Lorentz with a T, as far as I understand, has not much to do with this gauge condition. Uh, and the name is purely for historical reasons. But still, the story is very similar, and it's the same philosophy. You go to a specific gauge to remove unphysical degrees of freedoms. And it's clear that we can always go to this gauge because we can always find a solution to this wave equation here. This can always be constructed using the Green's function of the D'Alembertian operator box. So we can always solve this wave equation here, find a psi that removes the divergence, and then we are in a new coordinate system where the divergence of the metric perturbation vanishes. So now everything becomes much simpler. Uh, in this new gauge, in this new coordinate system, the Einstein tensor just looks like this. It's just box acting, that Lambertian acting on H bar. I mean, if you go back to this slide in equation three, you see the Einstein tensor, and we can uh, throw away this piece, this piece, and this piece, and we're just left with the Lambertian acting on the metric perturbation. But again, uh, if you want to really check all these steps, I invite you to just have a look at the slides, go back and forth and, and uh, see whether you agree with the expressions or not. All right, so this is now our Einstein tensor in Lorentz gauge, uh, but we're not done yet. So we still have a residual gauge freedom and this is also very similar to electrodynamics. Um, so now we can still choose new, uh, four new functions, psi, um, that preserve the Lorentz gauge condition. So when we are in a situation where the right-hand side vanishes already and we perform another gauge transformation um, such that box psi is zero, then we will not add anything to the right-hand side uh, and we'll preserve our Lorentz gauge. So there's this residual gauge freedom of four functions satisfying this condition here. All right, um, but first let's have a look at the equation of motion for our metric perturbation now. Uh, in Lorentz gauge. So we just take the Einstein equation. Einstein equation is Einstein tensor equals energy momentum tensor times one over Planck mass squared. And if I use this very simple result for the Einstein tensor, I find the equation of motion for my metric perturbation. So it is really a wave equation, box acting on H bar. And then there's a source term on the right-hand side, which is given by the energy momentum tensor. Now let's make things even a bit simpler and go to vacuum. So in vacuum, um, the energy momentum tensor on the right hand side just vanishes. And the equation of motion is just the equation of motion of, uh, uh, of basically plane waves without any source on the right, hem right hand side. So now the equation of motion is just box h bar equals zero. And that very simple equation of motion is invariant under coordinate transformations that preserve the Lorentz gauge. So now if we just look at metric perturbations in vacuum, uh, we can still use our residual gauge freedom to remove even more unphysical degrees of freedom and our equation of motion will not change. Okay, let's do this. So now we can use our residual gauge freedom and impose the last four conditions to really fully and completely fix the coordinate system and fix the gauge. The first condition we can impose is to say the trace 
of our metric perturbations should vanish. Okay, so we just set h or h bar to zero. But if the trace vanishes, there's no difference anymore between our metric perturbation and this trace reverse metric perturbation. So then the bar has no meaning anymore and we can just drop it. Okay, so this makes life much simpler. No trace. Uh, and then we can impose three more conditions on these mixed temporal and spatial components of the metric perturbation. So uh, these are three more conditions. We have the condition for Lorentz gauge. So this is what I showed on the previous slide. This is still holds. This is the condition for Lorentz gauge. Uh, but combined with this new with these new conditions here, just means that in this contraction, all the spatial parts drop out. And I'm just left with the first term in this contraction here, which is time derivative acting on H not not. Uh, and this is what you see here on the right hand side. So these three conditions plus Lorentz gauge condition gives me that condition here. That tells us that uh, the time derivative is zero. So this must be a constant. However, the zero zero component of the metric perturbations is something that can be identified as the gravitational potential in Newtonian physics. And recall we're talking about a situation in vacuum here. So uh, if the potential is just a, supposed to be a constant, we can equally just set it to zero. So now the combination of these conditions just tells us that um, basically all these entries of the metric perturbation vanishes, vanish, but also this one here. So together, all of these components of the metric perturbation vanish. If, um, yeah, the indices involve a temporal index, so it's the temporal uh, metric perturbation and the mixed perturbations, they are all set to zero. Uh, the trace is set to zero, and the Lorentz gauge condition now only refers to the spatial components of the metric. Um, and this completely fits so the transverse traceless gauge because the trace vanishes and the spatial components satisfy the so-called transverse condition. So now we're in a position to really count the physical degrees of freedom. Remember, we started with 10 components of the symmetric metric perturbation H mu in the beginning, so 10. Then we got rid of four degrees of freedom because we imposed the Lorentz gauge condition. You can still see it here. This removes four degrees of freedom. And then we used our residual gauge degree, uh, residual uh, gauge freedom in vacuum um, to fully fix the gauge and arrive in the transverse traceless gauge. So 10 minus 4 minus 4 leaves us with two physical degrees of freedom. And these are the transverse polarization states of gravitational waves, which are typically called H plus and H cross. And you can see them here uh, in this little cartoon on the left-hand side. So the direction of motion, the propagation direction is perpendicular to your screen right now. So the gravitation, gravitational wave either goes into your screen or comes out of the screen. Um, and then these polarization states, H plus and H cross, they squeeze and squash uh, space in the plane perpend perpendicular to the uh, direction of propagation. And H plus gives you uh, that oscillation pattern here and then the H cross uh, polarization is rotated with respect to this by an angle of 45 degrees. So now we have identified the propagating physical degrees of freedom and it's two uh, that are contained in the general metric perturbation. All right, so now I want to take it a step further um, uh, I had a question, actually. Yes, um, please, please, yeah. please. Um, of course. Would you remind me um, if you include a cosmological constant? Does this gauge fixing still work? Oh, that, that's that's a very good question. Um, I'm <laughs> uh, I'm not sure whether I'm really qualified to answer this question. I, I can imagine that there are some subtleties. I remember that not too long ago, I've seen a paper on the archive that addresses exactly this question. Um, and yeah, I can try to look it up. Uh, I, I think th that there might be some subtleties and it, I, I'm sure you can still define gravitational waves, but uh, I, I can also imagine that you have to pay attention to a couple of details. I mean, please 
note that here in this derivation, I, I just started with a flat Minkowski background and I even set the source term on the right hand side uh, to zero. So I just talked about vacuum, um, the vacuum situation. And now in the next few minutes, I will take this to, um, well, the next level, step by step, and then make the situation more complicated. I also want to talk about gravitational waves in an expanding uh, Friedman, Lemaitre, Roberts, and Walker background, so some gravitational waves in a cosmological context. Um, and yeah, I, I, I imagine that this will also include the case of dark energy or cosmological constant. Um, but again, I, I think uh, some of the subtleties are maybe even still um, the subject of ongoing research. And as I said, I mean, I saw a paper on this not too long ago in the archive. So I don't want to say anything wrong. In principle, it will work, uh, but it might be that you have to pay attention to a couple of details. All right, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, yeah. So as I just said, I want to make things a bit more complicated um, and then uh, yeah, lift some of the assumptions I, I just made, uh, but still, I think you can still discuss gravitational waves in uh, even more general context and, and uh, well, yeah, maybe even consider the, the impact of dark energy on the propagation of gravitational waves. But yeah, so now I want to um, uh, identify the physical degrees of freedom independent of a particular gauge choice. Because I mean, uh, what I did on the previous few slides was really to uh, just apply some brute force approach and, and uh, really try to get rid of and kick out all the unphysical degrees of freedom, no matter what, um, to, 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 to just uh, keep the physical degrees of freedom. Uh, but this really required to go to a very specific gauge. And now I want to do the same in a gauge independent way. Uh, and I also want to allow uh, for fluctuations in the energy momentum tensor. Uh, for simplicity, I want to assume that the expectation value of the energy momentum tensor is still zero. So everything I'm showing to you, going to show to you now still applies to uh, a Minkowski background. We still, we're not talking about curved space yet, uh, but locally I allow for sources and fluctuations in the energy momentum tensor. Okay, uh, and then the important uh, tool here or the strategy to talk about gravitational waves in this context is to decompose the metric perturbations and the perturbations of the energy momentum tensor into functions that transform as irreducible representations, irreps, of spatial rotations. So functions that behave like uh, scalar functions, vectors, or tensors under spatial rotations. And just a word of caution. So now I'm going to use a new notation. Now the metric perturbations, the spatial part of the metric perturbation is called delta G with indices ij. And hij itself is now the tensor component of these general spatial perturbations delta Gij. Um, so hij now really is the object in this decomposition that transforms as a tensor. But let me just show this to you explicitly. Um, and again, this is just for illustration. Don't try to really track each individual factor of two or one third here. I just want to show to you how it's possible. So I take my metric perturbations and the perturbations of the energy momentum tensor, and I decompose this into scalar functions, vector functions, and tensor functions. Um, and to keep the number of degrees of freedom the same, on both sides, on the left-hand side and the right-hand side. Um, this decomposition needs to be supplemented by a couple of constraint equations. Otherwise, there will be too many degrees of freedom on the right-hand side. And just as an example, uh, we have the spatial, uh, the perturbations of the spatial part of the metric. Uh, you can see these scalar functions and, and this vector function here, but also the true tensor part, which really transforms as a tensor under spatial rotations. And then the constraint equations for these tensor components here are now these conditions. And these are exactly the same conditions we imposed on the spatial components of the metric perturbations on the previous slide when we talked about the transverse traceless gauge. So in a sense, this is mirrored here. And then we use similar constraints uh, on these tensor components of the metric perturbations. OK, so we can derive um, well, uh, sorry, yeah. Uh, so now these functions, they 
depend or they change under corner transformations. If I perform a corner transformation as on the previous slides, uh, they are not gauge independent, but I can construct gauge invariant linear combinations. Uh, for instance, this scale of these scalar functions phi and a theta. These are very closely related to the gravitational potential in Newtonian physics, some gauge independent uh, vector function, sigma i. And then it turns out that uh, the function hij is already gauge invariant by itself. I don't need to combine it with anything else. I mean, yep, it, it is already invariant at this level of perturbation theory by itself. Okay, and then from the Einstein field equations, we can derive field equations for these gauge invariant functions. So the first three, phi, theta, and sigma, they just satisfy Poisson type equations. So look at this one here, for instance. This is basically the Poisson equation for the gravitational potential in Newtonian physics. Rho is the energy density, which comes out of the other. Uh, and then theta is proportional to the gravitational potential. Uh, in our tensor perturbations, they also, have, they also satisfy field equations, but this is not a Poisson type equation. This is now really a wave equation. And among all these functions, the tensor perturbations are really ones that satisfy such a wave equation. So the tensor perturbations are the only gauge invariant degrees of freedom satisfying a wave equation. And they are totally propagating in physical degrees of freedom. All right, so this already um, brings us yeah, back to the statement I showed to you at the very beginning. I said that the gravitational waves are tensor perturbations that satisfy a wave equation and that they're gauge invariant. Um, and this statement applies to this discussion here, where we talk about this decomposition at first order in perturbation theory. Okay, so let's make things even a bit more complicated. Uh, now, I don't wanna talk about any more about a flat background. I want to talk about gravitational waves in a curved background. And then uh, here we have to pay attention to the separation of scales. So we consider a background metric, G bar, that varies itself. It's no longer just a constant Minkowski background a metric, met, met, blah, 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 <laughs> metric, but a metric that describes a curved background. So G bar varies on a length scale LB and on a time scale TB. Um, and if the background itself varies, it's a bit difficult to uh, define gravitational waves on that background. And this only works if we can clearly separate the different scales involved in the problem. So now we can look at perturbations of the background metric that vary on scales delta L, which are much smaller than LB, and that vary on time scales delta T that are much smaller than the time scale of the background. And if that is possible, then we can clearly define gravitational waves and we can write the metric as the background piece plus these small perturbations. And again, we require that the perturbations are much smaller than the entries of the background metric. Okay, so now for a source term in the Einstein equation, because we want to talk about a curved space-time background, which means we allow for a non-vanishing background value of the energy momentum tensor. Uh, and if there's an energy momentum tensor, this also includes the contributions from gravitational waves itself. So uh, TGW on the right-hand side of the Einstein equation. Uh, we can calculate this energy momentum tensor of gravitational waves, uh, but this requires a calculation in second order perturbation theory over a general curved, uh, much more complicated than all the calculations I showed to you uh, before. The expectation value of these metric perturbations, um, just the expectation value of the perturbation vanishes. So we have to go to second order in perturbation theory so that we get something that does not vanish. Uh, and it's then you find this expression here, uh, which is the expectation of this product of um, yeah, functions of the metric perturbation. And the expectation value here, this denotes an average over length and time scales that are somewhere in between the length and time scales of the perturbations and of the background. This, this is how this expectation value is defined. Um, and this energy momentum tensor contains an important quantity that we will also need later on, basically throughout the entire lecture series, namely the energy density contained in gravitational waves. And then in transverse traceless gauge, um, you can 
yeah, this becomes uh, a simple expression. It's uh, the energy density is just the zero zero component of the energy momentum tensor. Uh, and in this gauge, um, you can write it like this, where we have now uh, two powers of the time derivative of the spatial perturbations of yeah, the spatial components of our metric perturbation. All right. Um, and just for completeness, let me also show to you the equation of motion on a curved background without any gravitational wave source. Uh, so it, it, this expression here, where we have the covariant derivative um, uh, and the curvature tensor, uh, we will not need this later on, but just to show to you that uh, this now looks a bit more complicated than the simple case of just uh, box H equals zero uh, in flat Minkowski space. All right. Um, yeah, but for basically the entire rest of, of the lecture series, I, I want to focus on a particular type of curved background um, scenarios. And then these are uh, the cosmological background solutions of Einstein's uh, field equations, namely the Friedman, Lemaitre, Robertson, Walker uh, background. And in this case, the space-time metric is of this form here. Um, this describes a homogeneous and isotropic universe in accordance with the cosmological principle. And then they also describe an expanding universe by means of this scale factor A that grows as a function of time here in front of the spatial part of the metric. Um, these FLRW solutions can describe uh, positively and negatively curved um, spaces. And this is accounted for by this parameter K. And if K is zero, uh, we just describe an expanding flat universe. All right. Uh, and the question is, how do we define gravitational waves uh, on such a background? So the strategy, I don't show this, I won't show this to you explicitly, but just to tell you, the strategy is the same as before. So we repeat our scalar vector and tensor decomposition now in this expanding background. And we also include um, the source terms uh, for the background metric. And I imagine that this can also include uh, dark energy but again, uh, there might be some subtleties, but in principle, I think it would go just go in here and then you would follow the same uh, logic. But if you do this, um, then it's straightforward to generalize our definition of gravitational waves uh, from the flat space result. So uh, for simplicity, just let's just look at the case of flat, uh, an expanding flat universe. We put K to zero, and then the space-time metric is of this form here. So we have the FLRW scale factor, A out front, uh, and the gravitational waves correspond to these spatial perturbations of the space-time metric, uh, Hij, uh, and they satisfy this condition here again so that they contain only two physical and propagating derivatives of freedom. Uh, okay, this is what I just said. Um, the expectation value of these perturbations is zero, and uh, these tensor perturbations just as we discussed when we looked at the SVT decomposition, they are gauge invariant in first order perturbation theory. Uh, and in first order perturbation theory, uh, there's also no coupling between um, these tensor perturbations and any other scalar or vector perturbations that I could include here in the metric. So these tensor perturbations don't couple to scalar and vector perturbations in first order perturbation theory. Uh, and then uh, evolve by themselves. All right, so in the next, yeah, we still have roughly 25 minutes. Um, I, I want to talk about the propagation of gravitational waves in the expanding universe. So now after 10, 15 minutes, uh, we made it to the point where we have properly defined gravitational waves in an expanding universe. And now we want to look at the propagation of these gravitational waves. And for this, we can study the equation of motion for our object Hij, so the transverse traceless or TT piece of the metric perturbation. And this equation of motion just follows again from Einstein's uh, field equations, but now in this given expanding cosmological background. And here you see the, uh, the equation of motion. Um, and let me just briefly walk you through it. Um, we write it down in terms of the coordinates that you've also seen in the metric. So T is cosmic time in the FLRW metric and X uh, corresponds to the co-moving spatial coordinates. Um, there's a new term in the equation of motion because we are talking about this expanding background. This is a Hubble friction term that is proportional to the Hubble rate H, which is defined as A dot. 
Um, and then we will see the impact of this term later on when we talk about solutions of this equation. Uh, in general, there will be a source term here on the right-hand side. And then this is the anisotropic stress tensor pi ij. And let me maybe just briefly jump back to my scalar vector tensor decomposition. Uh, you've seen it here already in this equation of motion. And the pi ij is the tensor part of these spatial perturbations of the energy momentum tensor. This is where pi ij comes from. And it appears again on the right-hand side of our equation of motion here. Uh, and in the FLRW background, you can actually write down an explicit expression. So it's given in terms of the spatial components of the energy momentum tensor uh, and the pressure P in your background uh, solution. And then again, times the metric. Uh, and you see that here we have pi ij with an index TT. So this means that this TT piece is the transverse traceless part of our anisotropic stress tensor. Uh, and the question is, how do I get the TT part out of the anisotropic stress tensor? And this is typically done in terms of a projection operator. Um, yeah, let me just briefly explain how this works. Um, don't, don't be scared if this looks a bit complicated, but the strategy basically is to do this projection in a Fourier space. So I take my anisotropic stress tensor, I decompose it into Fourier modes. Uh, you can see them here. Uh, which depend on time and some momentum vector k. And now I want to project out the transverse traceless part out of each individual Fourier mode, okay? And I do this with this projection operator O i j l m, okay? So this turns this Fourier component into the transverse traceless part of this Fourier component. And my projection operator is defined in terms of these operators uh, p, so if I take a Fourier mode with a momentum vector k, I can look at the unit vector that is pointing into the same direction. And this unit vector has some entries n i. I use these entries of my unit vector in the direction of k to construct the operator p. And then I can assemble all these operators p into this big object here inside the square brackets. That gives me the operator o. Uh, and then with the operator o, I project out the TT part. So now my TT part of the Fourier components satisfies these conditions here in Fourier space. And that simply translates into these conditions in position space. So now my TT part of the atypic stress tensor really satisfies the transverse traceless conditions so that this condition is satisfied on the right-hand side of the equation of motion and on the left-hand side of the equation of motion. And in principle, if I'm interested in gravitational wave from uh, a generic source, I have to uh, specify everything that's going on here on the right-hand side of the equation of motion. That defines the properties of the source. And then I can solve this equation of motion and find the gravitational waves uh, produced by the source. And to some extent, we will also do this uh, later on. Uh, but now let's look at slightly simpler situations where we just set the source to zero on the right-hand side. Um, so in the next step, I want to uh, guide you to a solution of this uh, equation of motion in the expanding universe. And it's most convenient to solve this equation of motion in Fourier space. So I showed to you on the previous slide already how we decompose the source term into Fourier modes. But now I want to go a step back and just decompose our metric perturbations into Fourier modes. You can see it here in equation 32. And I decompose my metric perturbations into modes with a definite momentum k uh, and a definite polarization plus or cross uh, p. All right. Um, and then the tensor structure is contained in this polarization tensors uh, E, so E plus and E cross. And they are constructed such that HIJ has all the good properties that we want. So the polarization tensors are real. Um, they are invariant if I uh, just flip the sign of n. And they are symmetric in these indices i and j. And they satisfy these equations or these conditions here, which makes sure that h i z sorry that h i j itself satisfies this transverse the transverse traceless conditions. Um, the polarization tensors also satisfy these orthonormal and completeness relations. 
Uh, and just for, yeah, just for completeness, basically, I can also tell you that if I look at one Fourier mode with a momentum K, I can take um, the unit vector showing into that direction and look at the 2D vector space perpendicular to that. So this is the space in which the gravitational wave really stretches and squeezes uh, space. Uh, and in that 2D space, I can use uh, a set of basis vectors, U and V, and with these basis vectors in the perpendicular plane, I can write down explicit expressions for my polarization tenses and also for this projection operator Pij. Uh, but this is just for completeness. Uh, we will not need these relations later on, but I just uh, put them here so that you have seen them. All right, so the goal again is to solve the equation of motion and I want to solve the equation of motion in Fourier space. So I want to have some equation of motion for these Fourier modes here. Um, and yeah, so we want to do this again in, in our uh, expanding background. Let's have a look again at the FLRW metric. Uh, and then uh, just for convenience, uh, it, it's easier if we write down the metric in terms of conformal time. Uh, so that just means that I take my time piece in the metric and I pull out one factor of the scale factor. Then the metric looks like this. And eta is now conformal time. Um, yeah, uh, so this is just a definition in case you're not familiar with the conformal time. Now the scale factor multiplies everything here inside the square brackets. And the prime in the following in the following will denote a time derivative with respect to conformal time. All right, so now we're in a position to really write down the equation of motion in Fourier space. Um, so we have our metric perturbations uh, and the Fourier components of the metric perturbation um, in, in, in Fourier space. But I can find this object today, which still contains the polarization tensor and in one power of the scale factor. So if I use my, if I don't use my Fourier mode, but I use this entire object here, um, it becomes a bit simpler to write down the equation of motion in, in Fourier, so, uh, Fourier space. Here in equation 37. So now we have a very simple equation of motion for capital H on the left hand side. Uh, and still a source term on the right-hand side. Uh, but now we can just consider the space-time volume in which the source is not active, or we just consider no source at all. So we just put the right-hand side uh, to zero. Then it's also not necessary to uh, pay attention to this tensor structure here anymore. So we can just drop the polarization tensor. Uh, and now we have this simple equation of motion. We drop the polarization tensor because there's nothing um, on the right-hand side. And this is the equation of motion then just for our full remote times one power of the scale factor. So the same as, as up here, all right? Um, uh, and now this is, this is a simple uh, differential equation. Uh, we can just write down the general solution in terms of spherical Bessel functions if we assume some power law behavior of the scale factor. So if the scale factor goes like conformal time to some power n, this is the general solution. Uh, and I mean, it's, it's a general and formal solution, but there you have it. Uh, this is the solution that describes how gravitational waves propagate in an expanding universe if there's no source around anymore. Uh, and that includes here the, the full information uh, on that. Uh, obviously, we still have some constants of integration, uh, these functions A and B. Um, a priori, these are unspecified. Uh, but these constants of integration are simply fixed by the boundary conditions, by the initial conditions that describe how these gravitational waves have been produced in the first place. All right. Um, but, uh, well, it's, this, this expression maybe doesn't tell you much. It looks a bit complicated, uh, and we don't have a good intuition for the behavior of these spherical Bessel functions. So now let's look at the general solution of this equation of motion uh, slightly uh, simpler cases. All right. So again, question. here so you have. For... Yes. So Is there a question? Small h in the beginning. In the yes. We scale the matrix perturbation. Tensor perturbation, right? Tensor perturbation, right? Yes. Yes. So the capital H is the. the capital H is the. Uh, I can hear my voice. Sorry. I can hear my voice. So sorry. here. Ah. So here. <laughs> Uh, maybe if I mute myself. So here the yeah, there's a small h 
uh, with a P sub index and subscript. So small h is the original uh, tensor perturbation in momentum space, right? It's just to, to express the yes. Like yeah. So I mean, it's it's a simpler form. Yes. I mean, in a sense, you can think of uh, this capital H here as some kind of uh, co-moving tensor perturbation in momentum space. So uh, the equation of motion just takes a simpler form if I multiply my little h by one power of the scale factor, because um, yeah, then the decay of h with the expansion of the universe as a function of a is sort of factored out. Um, so yeah, capital H is sort of a co-moving version of little h. And I can then first solve this equation of motion for capital H. And the solution is basically a square bracket times eta. Okay, so then the square factor, you just pull it over to the other side. And then you have a times little h, which is capital H here on the right on the left hand side. And I find the solution. But then I, I just take the power of the scale factor and pull it over to the other side. And now it appears here in the denominator. And then this is the solution of little h. I mean, it's a, it's a computational trick because the equation of motion just looks a bit nicer uh, for capital H. But of course, the, the result is the same if I never introduce capital H. Uh, I can just turn this into an equation of motion for little h. And then the solution will be the same. OK. Yes, but um, I mean, the reason why we have 1 over a here is, is really because I, I first solve for capital H, and then I take the power of the scale factor from the left-hand side down here to the right-hand side. OK. Um, yeah, so now I want to look at slightly simpler uh, versions of that equation of motion and then slightly simpler versions of the solution. So this is, again, the very same equation of motion, the same as, as this one here, so nothing changes. Um, and I can, I want to, again, assume a power law behavior of the scale factor. Uh, just for um, uh, completeness, let me tell you that this power n here is, is 1 during radiation domination, 2 verse, uh, during metal domination, and minus 1 uh, during inflation or some de Sitter expansion. Uh, so just to tell you what's, what are some characteristic values of this power n. But if n is just a, a fixed integer, then I can evaluate this piece here, a double prime over a. And then you see the result here, uh, where curly h now is the um, Hubble rate with respect to conformal time. Yeah? So curly h is a prime over a. And if this is the behavior of the scale factor, then curly h is just proportional to one over eta. So it's inversely proportional to conformal time. And I have the power n appearing here in the numerator. Uh, and to compare these two terms here inside the brackets, uh, we can compare the wave number k to this conformal Hubble rate, curly h. So uh, that means we basically compare uh, the wavelength of our gravitational wave, 1 over k, to the Hubble radius, 1 over curly h. And we can consider two cases where uh, k is much larger than h. So this just means that uh, 1 over k is much smaller than 1 over h. So our wavelength of the gravitational waves is much shorter than the Hubble radius. Uh, but that also means that if, if k is much larger than h, for h here, um, I can pull this factor of eta to the left-hand side. So this means k times eta is much larger than 1. Uh, so now we look at the solution of this differential equation in the limit of k times eta much larger than 1. So we can just put this piece here in the equation of motion. And then this one here is dominant. Uh, and, and then this is just the harmonic oscillator for capital H. And we find this solution here for little h. So again, we pull the power of the square factor to the right side. Inside the square bracket, this is the solution for capital H 
And then these are just plain waves um, with yeah, positive and negative frequency. And again, some uh, constants of integration fixed by the boundary conditions. So uh, inside the Hubble radius, if that is the case here, the gravitational wave amplitude decays like one over A. You see it here, it's one over A. This is how the gravitational waves redshift or decay inside the Hubble radius. And now we can take our solution in Fourier space and go back to the solution in position space. So we just plug this into our Fourier decomposition. We find one over A, uh, and then we'll just have a plane wave uh, yeah, decomposition or plane wave contributions here inside the Fourier integral. Uh, and these constants of integration, which are fixed by the boundary conditions, and the boundary conditions describe the mechanism that generates these gravitational waves in the first place. All right, uh, and we can do the same for super Hubble mode. So now we look at the situation where K is much, much smaller than H or K times eta is much smaller than one. So now the wavelength is much longer than the Hubble radius. We can drop this piece here in the equation of motion. And now we find that uh, H prime prime over A prime prime is the same as H over A. So um, H must be proportional to the scale factor, which means that little h just does not depend on the scale factor at all. It's a constant plus a piece that quickly decays. I mean, um, yeah, to formally see this, just drop this piece in the equation of motion and then solve for capital H. This is the solution that you find. So we find that outside the Hubble radius, our metric perturbation is the sum of a constant and a quickly decaying piece outside the Hubble radius. So outside the Hubble radius, our gravitational waves, they freeze out and become a constant. Inside the Hubble radius, they decay like one over A. This is the important result here at this point. Okay, so now during the remaining, yeah, let's say five minutes, I want to briefly talk about stochastic backgrounds of cosmological gravitational waves. So now we can consider a gravitational wave source in the early universe, and we assume causality. So gravitational wave signal will be only correlated within causally connected patches. And we want to assume homogeneity and isotropy, which means that the same processes happen everywhere in our expanding universe at the same temperature, at the same time. Uh, of course, plus minus primordial perturbations. But apart from this, uh, the evolution of the universe is really the same everywhere. Um, so if we think about gravitational waves from the very early universe, we can uh, appreciate, we can um, anticipate that our gravitational wave signal that we receive today is composed of a very, very, very large number of individual contributions from all the um, individual causal patches, which are still described by the same physics because of homogeneity and isotropy. So because we receive um, such a large number of independent and individual contributions, uh, the gravitational wave signal from the early universe will always be a stochastic gravitational wave signal. We will never be able to uh, describe the exact value of Hij at a specific time, at a specific point, but we have to treat Hij as a random variable. And all we can do is to talk about the ensemble properties of this random variable. And then for this, we can carry out ensemble averages. And in our calculation, this will correspond to spatial and temporal averages. And then we can quantify the statistical properties of our gravitational waves. So yeah, let, let me summarize the properties of cosmological gravitational waves that we anticipate. Uh, we expect them to be statistically homogeneous and isotropic, just because they inherit this property from the FLRW background. And also in the absence of parity violation, we expect no preferred polarization. So this means if parity is not violated during the production of these gravitational waves, there will be no correlation between the plus mode and the cross mode. Or we can go to a different basis. We can, instead of plus and cross, we can go to the helicity basis uh, where we now talk about left and right-handed um, tensor modes, HL and HR the polarization tensors of this basis are related to the polarization tensors of the plus cross basis uh, as shown here in this equation. Uh, and then in this basis, in the helicity basis, uh, we now find that there's 
and then we have the same basically auto correlation of the left-handed and the right-handed most. There's no difference between left-handed and right-handed gravitational. It's our expectation uh, in case there's no parity violation at the time of production. And then finally, we expect mostly Gaussian statistics because we um, receive a signal from so many independent individual contributions. So in the central limit theorem, the structure of the signal then will just approach a Gaussian distribution. All right. Um, yeah, I still have two slides and I think I can uh, present them now during the last, let's say, three minutes or so. Um, to characterize the statistical properties of our stochastic variable, uh, we can use the power spectrum in Fourier space. So we just look at the um, uh, expectation value of the product of two Fourier modes. Uh, and then for a homogeneous, isotropic, unpolarized, and Gaussian background, this power spectrum will take this form. So the delta functions and this Kronecker delta make sure that this describes a homogeneous, isotropic, and unpolarized um, background signal. And then the entire statistical information is contained in this object down here. Uh, this is the power spectrum, or here it's called the characteristic strain, HC, and it's just a function of time and the absolute value of K. There's no dependence on the uh, direction of K because we're talking about an isotropic background. Okay, and the you can show that this characteristic strain then appears in the following way if you write down the two-point correlation function for the tensor perturbations in position space. So we look at this object here in position space, and this can be decomposed on a logarithmic K scale uh, by means of this characteristic strain. Okay, so the characteristic strain basically tells you the typical amplitude of your tensor perturbations uh, within a certain frequency interval. Um, and uh, we know that these Fourier modes decay like one over A, so also HC will decay like one over A inside the Hubble radius. Um, and yeah, HC is already one of the quantities you very often see in plots like this, where we talk about the uh, prediction from different sources and the sensitivity of experiments. Very often you see HC here on the vertical axis. And it, as I said, it describes, describes the typical amplitude per logarithmic K interval. Very often you see also a related quantity here on this axis. This is the strain power spectrum. So you just take HC squared and divide by frequency F. This gives you the strain power spectrum. And there are many versions of such plots where SH appears here on the side. And now I valid everything in terms of frequency. So the frequency today is given by the wave number, which is a co-moving quantity. I divide by the scale factor. So now this turns into a physical quantity. The wave number to frequency, I still have to divide by two pi. So this is how I obtain frequency on this axis. And just as a word of caution, um, uh, very often you also have a factor of two down here. So this can lead to some confusion. Uh, and now finally, this is my last slide before I come to the summary. Uh, you can do the same. You can have a similar discussion um, related to the energy density of gravitational waves. So I talked about Hi. this object here already. This comes from... Uh, yes. There is a question in the chat window. Yes, I, I, I just saw this. Maybe I can just finish um, this lecture because I, it will still take me two or three minutes and then we can talk about the question during the break, if that's okay. Yeah, otherwise I will go over time too much. But yeah, I see the question. Uh, I, it takes me a couple of seconds to read it. So let's do this during the break. Thank you, I will come to this. Okay. Um, all right, so we, sh okay. we have seen this gravitational wave energy density, which comes from the energy momentum tensor. I can rewrite this as time derivatives with respect to conformal time. And I can decompose the same, the, the thing again uh, on a logarithmic frequency uh, scale. And then the integrand is just this object here, which is my uh, fractional energy in gravitational waves on this logarithmic frequency scale. Um, so inside the Hubble radius, I can now look at this object here and relate this to the characteristic strain. So basically, you take the solution uh, inside the Hubble radius, you perform this time derivative with respect to conformal time that gives you some uh, factor k squared here. Then you take the expectation value and the definition of uh, the characteristic strain and you find this expression here, okay? So now we see that um, 
this object, the fractional energy density in gravitational waves, goes like one over a squared, which comes from the time derivative. Uh, and then h squared, hc squared also goes like one over a squared. So altogether, the energy density in gravitational waves goes like one over a to the fourth power, which means inside the Hubble radius, gravitational waves just redshift like photons, just like radiation, as expected. Okay, so now we can take this object here, uh, the fractional energy density in gravitational waves, uh, and relate this to the total or critical energy density of our universe. So I divide by the critical energy density, and that gives me this omega par parameter, uh, which you also very often see here in plots of this type. Uh, by means of this relation here, we can relate this to the characteristic strain, and we can also relate this to the strain power spectrum. Uh, in a last step, uh, very often one multiplies omega by little h squared. So this h now is a measure for the Hubble parameter today. So it appears here, it's not a metric perturbation, it's just a measure for the Hubble parameter. If I multiply omega squared, then I will remove the dependence on the Hubble parameter and then h squared times omega gravitational wave is what you see here on this axis. And now this is the starting point to put in your theory predictions and to put in your experimental sensitivities and to start doing some physics to see which types of signals your experiments will be able to see in the future. All right, so um, this brings me to the summary of my uh, first lecture. Here are my take home messages. Gravitational waves open a new window onto the universe and they are a unique tool for fundamental physics. They are defined as radiative and gauge invariant tensor perturbations of the space-time metric. So they satisfy a wave equation and they are gauge independent um, at first order in perturbation theory. Um, the physical degrees of freedom correspond to two transverse polarization states, H plus and H cross, or you go to the helicity basis, then it's left-handed and right-handed gravitational waves. And these degrees of freedom, they explicitly manifest when you completely fix the gauge. And we've done this. So we completely fixed the gauge in vacuum, which led us to the transverse traceless gauge. Or you do the same in a gauge independent way if you perform a scalar vector tensor decomposition of your perturbations. And then you also find gauge independent tensor degrees of freedom at first order in perturbation theory. Uh, gravitational waves are also well defined on curved backgrounds. I just flashed uh, that discussion at you. And then they are also well defined in an FLRW cosmology. Uh, we looked at the equation of motion of gravitational waves, and we focus on the source-free equation of motion in an expanding universe. We solved this exactly in terms of spherical Bessel functions, but we also looked at the limiting cases of gravitational waves inside and outside the Hubble radius, and we found that inside the Hubble radius, the energy density uh, redshifts like radiation, and outside the Hubble radius, gravitational waves freeze out. Uh, we talked about the properties of cosmological gravitational waves. So typically, we expect them to be homogeneous, isotropic, unpolarized, and Gaussian. Uh, and we discussed the signal today, which can be represented in terms of the characteristic strain, the strain power spectrum, uh, or the energy density parameter h squared omega gravitational wave as a function of frequency. So this is the end of this lecture. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> And yeah, now let's have a break and also continue the discussion. Okay, thank you for your okay. comprehensive uh, discussion. I think it's very informative. Very informative. So we, okay, let's, let's so see we, it. Yeah. We, uh, yeah, I think yeah, we are supposed, uh, to resume we supposed to resume in 20 minutes. Okay. Yes, yeah, let's resume so, at 9.45. At yes. nine forty-five. Yes, yes. Uh, in our time for in our time for forty-five p.m. Forty-five p.m. Yeah. So, yeah. so do you want to so answer the question? Do you want to answer the, the question? Question? Oh yes, yeah. So if subhorizon modes K with one over a, do we have the same effect in gravitational waves coming from binary mergers? As there are absolutely subhorizon today, I know the amplitude decreases with one over r since it's a spherical wave, but I haven't been noticed uh, any decrement of amplitude to the expansion of the universe. Uh, yes, that's absolutely the case. I mean, you have to uh, take into account the redshift of, of your source, uh, and then that redshift will enter the final expression for the signal that you expect. 
So on the way from the source to the observer, um, these gravitational waves will decay in amplitude because of the expansion of the universe. The redshift appears uh, in there. But um, I mean, when we talk about gravitational waves from the early universe, the change in the scale factor can be extremely large. Yeah, So this can be a factor of billions and billions and billions, depending on how early these gravitational waves are produced. I mean, especially if you're talking about gravitational waves from inflation, the increase in the scale factor is enormous. Uh, but as for these astrophysical sources of gravitational waves, um, the change in the scale factor or the redshift factor will be some order one number. Um, I mean, there's some nice plots by the LIGO collaboration where they show which part of the observable universe they can probe with binary black hole mergers and binary neutron star mergers. I, I forgot the exact numbers, uh, but yeah, it's it's some order num some order one numbers uh, for for the redshift, maybe yeah two three something like this in the case of the binary black holes, right? But it it it's certainly the same effect. Yeah. Um, and then there's another comment that should be a new index in equation six. Uh, let's see. Maybe I should have a prize for. Uh, the person in the audience that finds the most typos. <laughs> okay, let's see. Uh, yes, that's correct. That's correct. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I will take a note. Equation six. Yeah, uh, maybe it would have been better to do this in some kind of index free notation. <laughs> I say, I know, I, say, I know. Yes, it's a typo, yes. Uh, <laughs> I have a, I have a yes, please. In Oripato, you are you that uh, gravitational uh, wave uh, 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 Yes. And, uh, and uh, or if we ignore the equation 47. 47. Yes. Yes, just give me a second. Uh, 47. Yes. I'm 47. 43. Uh, th th 37. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, no, no, no. It's 37. Yes. Uh huh. Or for we ignore the less described by that I. But if we last apply for by, yes, gravitational wave could be supported by that support. Yes, think gravitational wave. Really? Okay. Um, yes. So the right hand side, if you write it like this, the right hand side is always characterizes the source term. Uh, and of course, the propagation is only exactly free if the right hand side vanishes. So if there's always, if you keep some kind of source which remains active, then this will also affect the evolution of gravitational waves. And uh, let's see, I think I will mention this tomorrow. What I said at the very beginning, gravitational waves propagate freely. I mean, this is, I would say it's a correct statement, um, but depends on, yeah, what do you actually mean by this? Uh, I mean, in principle, in the very early universe, there are other effects like neutrino free streaming. Uh, this happens after neutrino decoupling in the early universe at a temperature of roughly one MeV. And then in between, neutrino decoupling and the time of radiation matter equality, much later, um, the neutrinos cannot be described anymore as a perfect ideal gas. Um, and they actually exhibit some anisotropic stress that appears on the right hand side of the equations of motion. So in between this time of neutrino decoupling and energy, sorry, in between neutrino decoupling and radiation matter equality, there will be a term on the right-hand side coming from the neutrinos, and this will slightly affect the propagation of these gravitational waves. So this will affect 
the amplitude of the gravitational waves at the level of order 10%. Uh, this is an effect from the early universe, uh, which is there in principle. It, I think it's very hard to measure. Um, we'll talk about this tomorrow, but it's true whenever there are some sources on the right-hand side or even some cosmological sources like this gas of free streaming neutrinos, uh, there will be some effect on the gravitational waves. Oh, you mean the big oh, you mean the big a neutrino, after neutrino. Mm -hmm. The maximum go to maximum go to isotropic. So on I so isotropic large pi term. Yes, yes. There will be a pi term. There's a pi term on the right hand side, coming from the neutrinos, during this time window in the early universe. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, there is some howling problem, some where, howling uh, problem. Uh, continuous yeah. problem of the howling. I don't know how to solve it. So whenever solve somebody it. else is saying, like, like me, do you hear howling also? Because um, my computer. For me, everything is fine. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, maybe you can turn down my volume a bit. Maybe. Um, it might help. I don't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Because the yeah is better now. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Let me. Maybe I can have a look into um, the Zoom settings. There is. Mm, suppress. Yeah. Please. Are we uh, resume the second? Uh, uh, lecture. Uh, okay, so that is about gravitational waves and experiments. Yes, that's right. Okay, so um, welcome back, everybody. Uh, and in this second part of the lecture today, I want to talk about. Uh, so in the first part, we talked about the theory of gravitational waves uh, in general relativity, and now I want to say a few things about the um, experimental aspects of looking for gravitational waves. Uh, and yeah, some of the ongoing efforts to search for gravitational waves. And I, I hope that the audio is okay now when I just speak by myself uh, and we don't have uh, a full discussion on, on Zoom. Um, yeah, I mean, I will still try to change my settings. Uh, and I can also tell you that in this lecture now, you will see uh, much less equations and formulas than in the previous uh, lecture and uh, many more figures and illustrations. Okay, so I would like to start with an overview of the global network of gravitational wave detectors and its um, development, its evolution uh, in the past. So uh, a map of yeah, gravitational ground-based laser interferometers. Uh, and the first generation of such interferometers were located in uh, Germany, the US, Italy, and Japan. So we uh, had and still have GEO 600 uh, in Germany, close to Hanover, uh, the first generation of LIGO detectors in the US, Tama, close to Tokyo in Japan, and Virgo uh, in Italy. Right now, gravitational have reached the second generation, and the second generation consists of advanced LIGO uh, in Hanford and Livingston in the US, uh, and also advanced Virgo in, in Italy. And at the same time, oh, in yeah, since then, uh, another experiment has gone online, namely uh, Kagra in Japan, in the Kamioka mine. And sometimes this is referred to as a generation 2.5 experiment because it uh, well goes beyond the existing or the other experiments in two round in the Kamioka mine, and it's cryogenic. And in this sense, it's also um, a Pathfinder experiment or some, some first version uh, of well, it's technology that will then also be used in the next generation and generation three ground-based interferometers. So this is the current situation. Uh, and again, the future looks very bright. So again, we are, I would say we are on the eve of multi-frequency gravitational wave astronomy. So here on this slide, you see the different experimental frontiers uh, in the field. Uh, in the future, we will certainly continue to look for gravitational waves on the ground in ground-based interferometers. Plans for the future include Cosmic Explorer, 
in the US. So this would be the successor of the LIGO experiment in the US. And then there are also plans for a next generation experiment in Europe, which goes by the name of ET, the Einstein telescope. Cosmic Explorer would again be some L-shaped interferometer and Einstein telescope would have some triangular uh, configuration. And then with these experiments, we would continue to probe the audio uh, band of gravitational waves. So frequency in the range from uh, 10 Hertz, maybe up to uh, the kilohertz range. The next frontier is to go to space and operate uh, satellite-based gravitational wave laser interferometers in space. The most mature, uh, mature um, proposal or project is LISA, the Laser Interferometer Space Antenna by the European Space Agency. And LISA will uh, presumably fly in roughly 15 years from now, so in the mid 2030s. There are also proposals for more futuristic space-based interferometers uh, that go by the name of BBO, the Big Bang Observer, and DSAIGO, a Japanese project. And then these would already uh, involve many more spacecraft uh, that would then fly in um, these more complicated configurations, a hexagon uh, complemented by two triangles. Another frontier to look for gravitational waves is the sky. Uh, so you can basically observe pulses across the entire Milky Way uh, and the precise arrival times of the pulses from these pulses to construct a gravitational wave experiment, a virtual gravitational wave experiment that has um, that's almost as big as the entire galaxy, a galaxy-sized gravitational wave experiment. And I will talk a bit, a bit more about this later during this lecture. For this, you need radio telescopes to monitor these pulses in the sky. So future radio telescope or telescope arrays such as SKA in South Africa and Australia will allow us, will allow us to set up new experiments looking for gravitational waves at particularly low frequencies in the nanohertz range. So here, um, I'm not showing uh, any pictures of, um, I mean, okay, these are just laser interferometer experiments, but in addition, you can also do atom interferometry to look for gravitational waves. There are proposals that go by the names of EDGE and AEON um, and MAGIS, uh, different type of technology to look for gravitational waves. And also Chinese proposals for space-based laser interferometers, Taiji and Tin Quin. Um, and apart from these experiments, you can also uh, perform observa cosmological observations, in particular, uh, observe the cosmic microwave background and look at the anisotropies of the CMB and also at distortions of the CMB black body spectrum to look for indications of gravitational waves. And I will talk about these CMB observations at the very end of this lecture. All right, um, so here's the outline uh, of the second half uh, of today's lectures. I will first talk about gravitational wave interferometers and then explain how to properly define the experimental sensitivity of such experiments and draw sensitivity curves. Uh, then we'll talk about pulses and pulsar timing arrays. And if there's still time, I will um, say a few things about gravitational waves and the cosmic microwave background. Okay, let's start with interferometers. So here on the left-hand side, you see a cartoon of a gravitational wave passing through a typical Markelson interferometer. And then this shows basically the simplest uh, geometry that you can imagine. The gravitational wave uh, goes in, in this direction here, uh, and it really stretches and then squeezes space uh, in the plane in which the interferometer arms are located. Uh, and then here it's even chosen such that we see a plus mode uh, polarization plates along the x and then the y axis uh, on which we also have um, the interferometer arms. So if this happens, uh, if we observe such a transient signal that goes into the detector and stays there for a fraction of a second and then leaves the detector again, uh, we can observe such signals as shown here on the right hand side in our ground based interferometers. So these are real chirp signals in the detectors from the mergers, uh, from the merger of a binary black hole, if, if I remember correctly. And you can study um, uh, the strain as a function of time, uh, the amount by which the interferometer arms are stretched and squeezed. Um, this is the wafer form down here in the last row for each of the individual detectors in Hanford, Livingston, and uh, at Virgo. 
Um, and you can also depict this in terms of these charts here, which show how much power the gravitational wave carries as a function of frequency and time. And this also um, yeah, uh, allows you to quantify the signal to noise ratio at which you can detect the signal in the detectors as a function of time. The question now is if a gravitational wave is going through the detector, uh, what really is it that determines the response of the detector and, and uh, what is the signal uh, that you can pick up in the data stream? And yeah, to study this question, to study or uh, to discuss what is the signal seen by the detector, we have to uh, take into account information on the detector geometry. So uh, the signal seen by the detector is actually the convolution of our gravitational wave with some tensor R, it's called the impulse response, which describes the detector geometry and the relative orientation of the detector with respect to the incoming gravitational wave. So the signal follows from this convolution where we multiply this detector uh, object, R, Ij, with the incoming tensor perturbation, and then we have to integrate uh, over time uh, and then position. All right. Um, and well, to be a bit more explicit about this, uh, yeah, uh, I, I want to discuss the signal in a bit more detail, but it's convenient to uh, do this discussion, uh, do this analysis. So again, I want to decompose the incoming gravitational wave into a sum or an integral over plane wave contributions. Uh, so you basically have seen this expression before. Um, and now I decompose the gravitational wave into, um, momentum modes, Fourier modes, with a definite frequency, a definite direction of propagation and polarization uh, plus or cross. I can do this for the incoming gravitational wave, but also for the impulse response of uh, the detector, and then construct the signal seen by the detector in the frequency domain. So S is the signal in the frequency domain. So it's nothing but the Fourier transform of this object S of T that we've seen on the previous slide. So this is just the Fourier transformation. Uh, if, if I now take the definition of S on the previous slide and work out this integral, I, I find this expression here where I now conclusion of basically the product of my uh, frequency modes of gravitational waves. And then now this gets multiplied by the Fourier modes of my uh, impulse response, okay? Uh, which is different from experiment to experiment and which really takes into account Count the experiment and the orientation. All right. Um, so it's instructive to yeah to visualize the information contained in this object here. So if I take my the Fourier modes of the impulse response and plot a graph of the absolute value of r as a function of the direction in the sky for a fixed frequency, I obtain what is called an antenna pattern. Okay, you can see two examples here on the left-hand side. These are antenna patterns for a typical Michelson interferometer for some uh, incoming gravitational wave uh, with a plus or a cross polarization. Um, and then uh, you see the response of the detector as a function uh, of the angular direction. So basically uh, for each vector n, which describes the direction from the, which the gravitational wave is coming, I can look at, um, well, the corresponding position here on the surface uh, shown in these two plots. And that tells me how sensitive the detector is in its geometry to a gravitational wave coming from this direction. Um, and while well, explicitly, then for a given experiment, these antenna patterns and then these functions are, they can be computed based on the changes in the light travel time between test masses at the end of the interferometer arms. So if you really look at how the interferometer is set up uh, and you calculate how much these test masses uh, move, well, yeah, uh, how, how the distances between test masses are uh, squeezed and squashed uh, by means of the equation waves reaching the detector. All right, um, so these antenna patterns, they just describe the response of the detector with respect to some single incoming plane wave gravitational wave. Um, you can also construct some averaged quantities. And then this leads to the so-called signal response or detector transfer function. So now we can take our antenna pattern or the square of the antenna pattern and average 
over all directions in the sky. So one over four pi times this integral. And we average over both polarization states. So we sum over the plus and the cross mode and divide by a factor two. And this average of the square of the antenna pattern gives us this function R, which is the detector transfer function, which is basically the average response of our detector to gravitational waves coming from all directions. And you can plot it as a function of frequency. You can see it here in the plot on the left-hand side. Um, and then the function depends, for instance, if you just consider a, a Michaelis interferometer with an opening angle delta between the interferometer arms, you can calculate this function and you see the result here for some L-shaped interferometer, it's the blue curve. And if you have some triangular shaped interferometer, such as for instance, Einstein telescope in the future, uh, you have to look at the orange curve. And then now this function, the detector transfer function, quantifies the loss in the sensitivity due to the fact that on average, the gravitational waves do not always arrive from the optimal direction where you really have the optimal response of the detector to the gravitational wave. Okay, so this function R is really an important uh, quantity if you want to discuss you know, the average sensitivity of your detector and the sensitivity to a stochastic signal of gravitational waves coming from all directions in the sky. So this is especially important if you talk about cosmological gravitational waves. Okay, so in so far, but of course in any detector, the data stream will be composed not only of the signal, but it will also include noise contribution. So the data of your detector will be the sum of some signal, if it's there, hopefully, uh, and some noise. And the question is, how do we find a stochastic gravitational wave background in this data stream? So for this, we have to characterize the statistical properties of the signal and the, oops, yep, and the statistical properties of the noise. The noise can be characterized by the detector noise power spectrum. So basically you take the variance of that noise, the expectation value of the noise is squared. And if you decompose this on a linear frequency scale, um, this defines the detector noise power spectrum. Uh, something that theorists cannot really calculate. Um, this is what the experimentalists need to provide. The experimentalists need to explain how different types of noise thermal noise, seismic noise, and so on, really contribute to this detector noise power spectrum as a function of frequency. Power spectrum, so it appears here in the integral, but it can also be defined just as the expectation value of the product of uh, two Fourier modes as usual. So this is how the detector noise power spectrum is defined. And uh, we can do the same for the signal, the first piece here in the data stream. Uh, and the signal is now characterized by, um, the strain power spectrum. We've seen this in the first lecture this morning, <laughs> this afternoon for you, for me, uh, this morning. Um, it's also detect, uh, characterized by the detector transfer function R. So if you go back to the previous slides and look at the definition of S uh, and then use all the quantities I introduced, you can yourself that the expectation value of S squared is now uh, this integral over frequency. So we have a decomposition on the frequency, linear frequency scale. But there's not only one power spectrum, there's the strain power spectrum S, but this needs to be multiplied by the detector response function to basically explain how you go from the raw signal, the raw gravitational wave, to the response in the detector. And again, there's a similar definition here in Fourier space where R times S is just the power spectrum um, of these Fourier modes. All right, um, before we go on, let me just briefly show this picture down here. So these are actual detector noise power spectra. So this thing here, denoise, for a couple of experiments. You see um, real data for LIGO, Hanford, and Livingston um, after observing or during observing run two, or two. These are these uh, black and gray uh, curves. This is the detector noise uh, during O2. And then projected or some expectation for the detector noise of uh, Kagra, Einstein telescope, LIGO at design sensitivity, Cosmic Explorer, and so on. Uh, so this is the starting point of this noise discussion coming from the experimental side. And now the challenge is to look, if, if we want to find the stochastic gravitational wave background, um, we have to dig out a signal 
which looks like noise itself from the detector noise. So to expect the stochastic background signal from the noisy background, we have to, I mean, we can try to uh, play a couple of tricks. We can try to distinguish between signal and noise based on the spectral properties of the signal, just because maybe the frequency dependence here is very different from the frequency here in the detector noise. We can try to look for temporal modulations, maybe because um, this thing varies as a function of time, but then this would be very difficult for cosmological sources. Uh, we can also try to construct null channels in the experiment, so different ways of combining the data so that we can the noise in the best possible way, and then everything that's left over is mostly signal, if there's anything at all. Uh, such strategies are employed, for instance, or will be employed by the LISA experiment where you're able to construct a null channel. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very challenging in, in any case. And uh, if you just have a single detector at hand, uh, you want to find a stochastic background that your gravitational wave signal, the strain power, uh, power spectrum SH, is larger than uh, the detector noise divided by the response of your detector. So uh, SH should be larger than denoise over R or, yeah, I mean, it's straightforward. Uh, this PC on the right-hand side should be larger than this PC on the right-hand side. Um, however, if you work with a detector network, you can apply much more powerful techniques. So now, and this is what I want to talk about now in the next uh, few minutes, I want to talk about how you try to find a gravitational background signal in a detector network. And then it becomes possible to cross correlate the signal from detector pairs. So let's imagine two detectors, I and J. Each detector gives me a data stream, D. So I put um, my data stream of detector I here and the data stream of detector J here. And I can construct a new observable. I call this observable SIJ. Uh, and uh, well, try to find evidence for gravitational waves based on this observable, and I put in the filter function uh, that is optimized for this pair of detectors, I and J, such that um, this optimal filter maximizes this search variable or observable SIJ. So by construction, this filter will only depend on um, the time difference uh, between the detection and the two detectors, and then this is, this is determined uh, by the location of the detectors on Earth or in space, maybe eventually. And it should also be highly localized in time um, and should be centered around small values, maybe of the order of milliseconds for the gravitational wave signal to travel from one detector to the other detector. And the entire idea behind the strategy is now to take the data streams and optimize the filter, uh, which eventually gives the largest signal to noise ratio for this observable SIJ. Now let's try to see how this works uh, in, in practice. So I want to derive the expression for the signal to noise ratio of, of this object. Um, so we can calculate the expectation value of SIJ itself. Um, and if we assume that the noise in the detectors is the so expectation value of noise in one detector and noise in the other detector is zero, then the expectation value of Ij will be independent uh, of the noise here at this level and will be controlled uh, only by the uh, strength of the gravitational wave signal. Now, there's a new quantity here, um, which I have not introduced yet. So, I mean, the way you derive this is just based on all the slides before. Uh, so if you go back to these slides, you can try to do it yourself. Uh, and then you will find this object gamma ij here. And this is the overlap reduction function, fancy name, overlap reduction function for this pair of detectors ij. And by the way, I should also say that uh, q tilde now is the Fourier transform of my field work in Fourier space. So everything is ex expressed as a function of frequency. This is just the Fourier transform of um, the filter. Uh, and the overlap reduction function now is the generalization of the detector response function r for a pair of two detectors. Uh, so the expression here is pretty much the same as before, with the only difference that we don't have the square of the antenna pattern of one detector, but we have 
um, the product of these response functions for both detectors. So um, impulse response R for the first detector times the complex conjugate in Fourier space of the impulse response for the second detector. And then obviously if I say, okay, I equals J, if I just talk about the same detector, then this will, um, yeah, uh, con correspond again to the response function I introduced before. Okay, so this is the expectation value of S. This is our signal. And we can also characterize the noise. Uh, the noise is the root square of these fluctuations around the background signal, uh, the expectation value. Uh, we can calculate this based on all the previous expressions. Uh, and now we find that the root of this quantity here is given like this. So this depends um, mostly on the detector noise of the two detectors, I and J, basically. So now we have calculated the signal and the noise, and we can construct the signal noise. I mean, it's uh, in the line of text. I uh, just look at the signal to noise ratio, S over N. Uh, and all of this still depends on my filter function. So the filter function appears here and it appears here. And I still have the freedom to choose the filter in such a way that the signal to noise ratio is maximized. So now this basically turns into an optimization or maximization uh, problem. And one can show analytically that this filter function here, which depends on the overlap production function and these other functions, um, this optimizes the signal to noise ratio. With this filter, I get the largest possible, the optimal signal to noise ratio from the two data streams of my two detectors. And it's important to note that now the filter requires knowledge of the signal itself. So I want to find a signal before I even detect the signal in the data, I have to apply a filter that already knows how the signal looks like. You see, the filter depends on the strain power spectrum. That's a bit strange, but in practice, you can actually work with the filter if you employ template banks. So basically you always make some educated guess or you make some, some answer, some hypothesis you want to test uh, for the type of signal that you're trying to find in the data. Uh, and then I just plug in the expectation for my signal into the filter. Uh, and the better this expectation or this educated guess is to the truth, to the real signal, the better the filter and also the higher the signal to noise ratio I can retrieve from my analysis from the real data. All right, uh, so let me just show you a couple of plots to um, show to you how this looks like uh, in, in, in practice, in reality. Uh, I, here you see these overlap reduction functions uh, for different pairs of detectors. So recall, overlap reduction function is this object here in equation nine. Uh, and now I can calculate the overlap reduction functions for all these pairs of detectors. So LIGO, Hanford, Livingston is the black curve. Um, yeah, so this is maybe one of the most important uh, functions here in this plot. But then if you extend the network by Virgo, you want to also want to know what is the overlap reduction function between Hanford and Virgo. This is uh, the red curve and Livingston and Virgo. This is the orange curve and so on. Okay. So these are practice already. Um, and then in the future, we will also need the functions for, um, yeah, uh, these future experiments, DBO and Tesago in space and Einstein telescope on the ground. Uh, just technical detail, these functions are normalized such that they give a value of one for a pair of identical and co-located, co-aligned detectors uh, with an opening angle delta. Okay, um, so this is just to relate Little gamma here on this axis to capital gamma, which you've seen on the previous slide. All right, um, so take it a step further and not only look at two detectors, but let's look at an entire network of detectors. Uh, maybe let's say four detectors, Hanford, Livingston, Virgo, and Kagra. These are four detectors already. Uh, and then calculate the total signal to noise ratio if you really combine all these detectors together. So then the total signal to noise ratio will be the sum in quadrature of the individual signal to noise ratios for the pairs of detectors. So uh, each individual pair gives me a signal to noise ratio rho ij and the result is shown here. So this is um, this quantity signal to noise ratio evaluated for the optimal filter. So if I plug in the optimal filter, 
here and here, I get this expression. All right, uh, and this can be simplified a bit because this looks ugly and then complicated. Um, the information on the signal is contained here in the strain power spectrum, which we introduced in the last lecture. And now I can take everything else. I can take the sum over the detector pairs. I can take the overlap reduction function uh, and the detector noise power spectra and put it into one effective new quantity. Uh, so I define the effective strain noise power spectrum for the entire network in this way. So now I have one quantity, this one here, that I can compare to the strain power spectrum up here in the numerator. Um, in the next step, I can still convert this into a gravitational wave energy density. So I take my strain power spectrum and relate this to this omega parameter, as we've seen it in the first lecture. And I take my effective strain power spectrum and just this huge combination of different uh, factors and convert this in the same way with the same prefactors into some omega parameter omega noise. And if I do this, I can write equation 13. Yeah, equation 13 in a much more compact way. So now instead of the strain power spectrum up here, I have some omega signal. And the combination of all these functions and this conversion factor gives me omega noise down here in the denominator. So now my signal to noise ratio is really a signal to noise ratio, ratio of uh, omega signal and omega noise. But what's left here in this analysis, and we're still talking about this cross correlation analysis, uh, and search for stochastic gravitational wave background, we still have this frequency integral and we still have um, basically an integration of a time or we multiply by the observation time of the entire measurement. So we see that um, this thing to noise ratio scales in the following way with the properties of the network because of this sum over all the detector pairs, my signal to noise ratio will scale like this uh, as a function of the detectors in the network. Okay, so the more detectors in the network, uh, the higher my signal to noise ratio. Uh, we also have this frequency integral, uh, which originally just comes from, um, yeah, uh, the Fourier transformation if we go to, uh, if you perform the space. space. Um, if I integrate over some bandwidth or some frequency range delta f uh, in certain, uh, across a number of frequency bins, then the signal to noise ratio will be proportional to the square root of the number of bins uh, and the width of each individual frequency bin. So in the end, basically proportional to the square root of the entire frequency range that I integrate over. Uh, that's very important because now this technique of searching for a stochastic background where I integrate over time and frequency can boost my noise ratio by many orders of magnitude. So such a cross correlation analysis over many years is much more sensitive than just one detector that is trying to find an instantaneous signal in gravitational waves at any given point in time. All right, so as for some illustration, let me show um, the effective strain noise power spectrum for a couple of experiments. So remember, this is equation uh, 14. Uh, this really includes the noise of the individual detectors in the network. Uh, and the information about the geometry in this detector, uh, sorry, in this overlap reduction function. Um, and then you can construct these effective strain noise power spectra, uh, which you see here. Uh, and then these sensitivity curves, they characterize the instantaneous sensitivity of the network, uh, but I have not yet integrated over time and frequency here. So basically this plot, what's going on inside the integral, Maybe I should show it here, or I can also show it here. Um, this is the sensitivity inside the integral. But then in the next step, it will be interesting to see how these curves um, improve even further uh, if we really take into account um, this effect of integrating over frequency and time. OK, so uh, let me summarize again the different types of sensitivity curves you can draw for an experiment. And here I just want to. Um, yeah, show to you how you do this for a simple two detector network. Uh, we just look at the sensitivity curves that you can construct for uh, LIGO Hanford and LIGO Livingston. And let's go through this plot here step by step. Um, 
the starting point is the black curve. So this is some kind of idealized version uh, of the detector noise spectrum for LIGO, Hanford, and Livingston. Um, this is really what the experiments have to provide you with. They have to explain to you uh, what is the detector noise as a function of frequency. In the next step, we can now construct the effective strain noise. Okay, um, this is the red curve here. So we just assume two detectors with an identical detector noise spectrum. Uh, and then the expression for the effective strain noise becomes a bit simpler. It's just this quantity here divided by the overlap reduction function for LIGO, Hanford, and Livingston. So for this gamma, you now use uh, up here. Uh, for this gamma, you use the black curve that we've seen previously here on, on this slide. And you see this, the response of this detector network begins to oscillate around zero as soon as you, I mean, for high frequency gravitational waves, when the wavelength has become shorter than the distance between the two detectors. Uh, and these oscillations in the overlap reduction function for Hanford and Livingston is now reflected here in the red curve where I have this dip in sensitivity uh, whenever the overlap reduction function uh, goes, to, goes through zero. All right. Um, so in the next step, we can rescale our uh, in the first step account for this improvement factor here if I integrate uh, over time uh, and in frequency. And then this scales the red curve down to the green curve. Uh, but we're not there yet. I mean, especially the green curve is something like the sensitivity per frequency bin. Uh, but I have not yet accounted for the total number of frequency bins. So um, what's very often done in the literature now is, is the following. One assumes that the signal actually corresponds to a power law, just a straight line in a log-log plot. Okay. And then the position of a power law signal, one puts the expectation for the signal into equation 16. So I just put a power law signal here up in the numerator. And I ask, what is the amplitude of this power law signal such that with my sensitivity, I obtain a signal to noise ratio of one. Okay, and then this is shown here in terms of these uh, black curves. Each black curve corresponds to a power law signal with a signal to noise ratio of one based on equation 16. And then finally, when I can construct the envelope of these black curves here. This is the blue curve, uh, where each of the black curves is a tangent at some point along the blue curve. And this is the famous power law integrated sensitivity curve for this detector network. Uh, and now this really takes into account um, the uh, geometry of the network, the number of detectors, the time of the measurement, uh, the width of each individual frequency bin, the total number of frequency bins, um, yeah, and then and, uh, well, the the effect of, of these integrations and then uh, the resulting values of the signal to noise ratio, namely that uh, each power law signal here along this blue curve gives you a signal to noise ratio of one. Uh, so the interpretation now is that if you consider a signal a power law signal that intersects the blue curve. Uh, it will give you a signal to noise ratio of larger than one. Um, and if I lower my power law signal such that it becomes a tangent of this blue curve, by construction, uh, the signal to noise ratio goes down to one. And then if I move my power law signal even further down so that it no longer touches the blue curve, then the signal to noise ratio goes below one. Um, this is a very powerful tool, but in a sense, uh, it's only exact and precise for really exactly power law type signals. And as soon as the signal becomes more complicated, this is still some uh, helpful visual representation, but it does not contain any exact information about the expected signal to noise ratio. Okay, so uh, following this algorithm or this procedure, we can now construct the power law integrated sensitivity curves for all these existing and future experiments. And if you compare this to the raw strain noise sensitivity here, I mean, actually you would have to put the plots next to each other. 
Um, but yeah, let's let's have a look. I mean, uh, Lisa goes down here to 10 to the minus 11 in this plot, and then the plot sensitivity curve uh, goes down to almost 10 to the minus 14 uh, on this axis here. So this is really a significant boost in the sensitivity uh, because we profit from this integration over time and frequency. And these plots where I have the power law integrated sensitivity, this is the starting point of phenomenological studies. So now I know the experimental sensitivities of these experiments and I, compared, I can compare this to the predictions for of gravitational waves. All right, so this is all I wanted to say about interferometers and, um, Sorry, and uh, experimental question, sensitivity please. curves. Sorry, uh, question, please. Yes, there's a question, please. So can you go back to the start with the signal lines, collect so signal, signal lines? Yes. So actually, I don't understand what this one? those black lines so, are. Actually, I don't understand what those black lines are. Yes, these black lines, I mean, these are not sensitivity curves. These are, um, these are this is basically an ansatz for the signal. This is an assumption about the signal. So, so you mean there you are imagine, there a lot of um, signals coming together? You mean there are, there are a lot of signals coming together? I mean, this is, okay, this is just, uh, uh, I mean, you don't expect such a signal in in reality. This is just for the purpose okay. of constructing the sensitivity curve. But you uh, assume okay. a, a set of uh, yeah, you know, hypothetical typically... signals. You presume, okay, maybe yeah, it looks like this. Okay. Maybe it looks, yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we have one online. Yes, yeah. So, yeah, we have one online. Right? Yes. I mean, you, you, you make this ansatz, you plug the power law signal into equation 16, uh, and each power law signal, mm has two parameters, an amplitude and a tilt. Okay, yeah. some index as a function of frequency. Yeah. And, and then I shift right. my power law up and down. I want to determine mm -hmm. the amplitude such that mm -hmm. equation 16 returns a value of one for the signal to noise ratio. And then I get this set of black curves and the envelope is the power law integrated sensitivity curve. Um, yeah, with this interpretation that above this curve, I always get rho larger than one for power law signals, and below the blue curve, I get a rho smaller than one for power law signals. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, but okay. it, it's it's okay. it's it's a trick on it, not a trick, but it's um, just a clever way of visualizing this sensitivity. I mean, you have to start from. Uh, somewhere. The thing is, I mean, the full information on the sensitivity is contained in this formula. So the full information is contained in 16. Uh, mm -hmm. But then the question is, how do I visualize this for different types of signals? Okay. And the choice by these authors, I mean, Romano okay. and Efrain was, okay, let's just consider power law signals and try to visualize the information contained in equation 16. Okay. And typically, I mean, okay. uh, this is a good approximation because right. each experiment has a small bandwidth. Uh, and then for many cosmological signals, it's, it's a, an okay approximation to say, okay, within this uh, frequency bandwidth, it's the signal is more or less a power law. If you have a strong deviation from a power law, this blue curve is not very helpful. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you, if you, for any generic and arbitrary signal, uh, it's really hard to draw a curve the best you can do then is just work with the equation, just work with equation 16. Um, mm -hmm. okay. And then if my signal has a very strange behavior as a function of frequency, I cannot visualize any, I cannot draw any curve, but I can just plug the function in here. I calculate the integral and then mm -hmm. I know mm -hmm. rho mm -hmm. larger than one, mm -hmm. smaller than one, okay. whatever comes okay. out. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yes. Good. Okay, okay, great. Okay. Well, then let's continue with pulses. Okay. Uh, how many, yes, how, many uh, uh, how many types of power law curves do you need? Uh, I mean, this you 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 are you can oh, you can uh, keep changing the the slope um, of the power um, I think this is. I think everybody who draws these curves maybe has their own code and then, then chooses a different resolution. Mm -hmm. um, I think you want to make sure that the blue curve looks smooth. Mm -hmm. So um, I I don't know I, I mean I it, it's once you have all the 
other information about the detector noise and all of that, it's really straightforward. If you do this uh, in Mathematica or on your computer, um, I mean, it's a couple of lines of codes, and then I would just choose the resolution of this spectral index as fine as possible to get the smoothest possible curve. Mm. So I think when I've drawn these curves, I vary the index of these black lines from minus eight to plus eight, yeah, so from some very large negative to some very large positive value mm. in very small steps. Mm. And then you maybe have a hundred black curves or something like this, or even more. And then the blue curve looks already very smooth. Mm. But I think this is, yeah, uh, mostly an aesthetic, aesthetic um, decision. Um, I mean, in principle, yes, you have to but come it, up with such an algorithm to I mean, draw in, in the any black case, curve. If you compare it to real data, then uh, and does it? Uh, yes, the bin meaning important. I mean, the bin the frequency mm -hmm. with in the data analysis um, might be relevant, or I don't know. Uh, yeah, I think I mean the frequency binning. Mm. The frequency binning, uh, I think, has has no effect on the blue curve for Paolo integrated sensitivity, mm. um, because okay, I mean, the way I wrote this here is that um, mm, yeah, I mean, here I basically break down the entire frequency uh, band into n bin times the width of each individual bin, but I don't have to write capital delta F like, like this. Um, I And then what I do, I just put in the Paolo signal mm -hmm. and I carry out the frequency integral. Mm -hmm. uh, and if I really carry out the frequency integral, uh, this just means that my delta F here goes to, to zero. I don't look at a discrete sum mm -hmm. uh, of what just the one, but I just carry I out the frequency. just the entire range of frequencies accessible. And this is how you construct the range of yeah. Accessible. Okay. Yeah. Um, right. Okay. And yeah, so in the end, you uh, want to compare this to uh, to actual data. But I should say, I mean, these sensitivity curves, you see them everywhere and all over the place, but they're just a visual guide. I would say. I mean, they are just they just allow you to draw some nice plots, which you can put in your paper. Uh, but I mean, all the meat, all the hard information, all the uh, well, yeah, the the true information is contained in this equation 16. So you can try to think of maybe even more clever ways to visualize the information contained in equation 16. Uh, but this will not improve the precision or the accuracy of the equation itself, yeah? So this is the result, and this is what it is. And then you can try to find your own clever way to visualize that. Yeah, yeah. But in the end, I mean, if you if you want to be as precise, if you want to be as precise as possible, you don't draw any plot, you don't draw any curve, you just carry out this integral, and then you get a number. You get a number for row. Okay. Um, so about pulsars. Uh, and I mentioned briefly already that you can use an array of pulsars across the Milky Way to construct a galaxy-sized gravitational wave detector. And I have a footnote here. Um, it's interesting to use pulsars to look for gravitational waves because the first indirect detection of gravitational waves was actually based on the observation of a pulsar, uh, namely by Hals and Taylor, who observed a binary system. Nowadays, it's called the Hals and Taylor binary. Um, and this is consistent. Uh, this is composed of a pulsar and an ordinary neutron star. Uh, and Hals and Taylor could show how the orbital uh, period of this system slowly decays because of the emission of gravitational waves. This was the first indirect evidence or detection of gravitational waves, and also led to the Nobel Prize for Hals and Taylor in the early 90s. Uh, but now, um, if, if you use this array of pulsars and then do some pulsar timing astronomy, uh, you actually want to find yeah, evidence of a more direct kind for gravitational waves. So pulsars, just as a reminder, are highly magnetized rotating dead stars, usually neutron stars, but I think there's also at least one pulsating white dwarf. But yeah, you should think of them usually as neutron stars. Uh, and in these neutron stars, they emit uh, synchrotron radiation, 
via the magnetic dipole axis. Uh, so this leads to this beam of radiation, uh, leaving the neutron star along its dipole axis. And um, if this axis is not aligned with the axis of rotation, we will only see the synchrotron radiation, the radio pulses or the radio radiation from these pulses whenever the magnetic north pole or magnetic south pole is directed towards us. So this um, turns these pulses basically into cosmic lighthouses uh, that give us um, a sequence of radio pulses at a very stable frequency. Uh, the rotation of uh, the rotation periods of these pulses is typically of the order of a couple of milliseconds up to a few seconds. And the fastest spinning objects, uh, these are millisecond pulses uh, with a, a frequency or with a rotation period of a few milliseconds. These objects originate from close binary systems. Recording so these pulses. Uh, so there was some kind of announcement. Uh, okay, I think I will just uh, carry on. Zoom just said something. Anyway, so um, these pulses uh, have a companion and they create material from the companion and spins them up so that they reach these very fast, um, uh, these very high rotation frequencies. Uh, yes, and then we see these pulses emitted from the magnetic poles and this turns the pulses into cosmic lighthouses. Um, these are very stable objects because of the high orbital momentum that they carry. So in a sense, these pulses, they provide us with a network of ultra precise clocks in the sky. And now we can look for tiny distortions in this train of pulses arriving in our radio telescopes, radio telescopes uh, caused by um, long wavelength gravitational waves in between us and the pulses. So gravitational waves that stretch and squeeze space-time um, across the Milky Way and also change the um, path or the length of the path along which these pulses are traveling towards us, the observers, and our radio telescopes on Earth. Okay, so how does this work in, in practice? Um, the important observable are timing residuals. So we measure the time of arrival of these pulses in our radio telescopes um, very precisely and compare this to theoretical expectations. So we measure the time of arrival uh, and relate this or convert this to the time of arrival at the solar system very center. Um, this defines a coordinate system, a stable coordinate system that does not change within a year as, uh, the, orbit, as the Earth orbits around the sun. Um, so we convert our measurements on Earth to the times of arrival in that coordinate system. Uh, and we compare this to a model expectation for each of the individual pulses. So for each pulsar, I, uh, we have to come up with a timing model that knows the pulsation frequency, the time derivative of the pulsation frequency, the second time derivative, and so on. Obviously, the position of the pulsar, its proper motion in the sky, maybe the binary dynamics if the pulsar is part of a binary system, relativistic effects, and so on and so forth. So this is really um, the hard part of this entire analysis to come up with a very precise timing model. So that we can look at the difference between the uh, expected times of arrival and the measured times of arrival. And then these are the timing residuals for each individual path. So you can see such timing residuals here uh, in the data set from one of the uh, pulsar collaborations, pulsar timing collaborations. Um, the such an experiment is basically just um, described in terms of two quantities in, an, in the idealist, idealized situation. So uh, you want to observe the pulsars as often as possible. This is called the cadence of your observations. Um, so typically delta t is of the order of a few weeks, which means that I observe each pulsar every few weeks, maybe every two weeks, three weeks and really measure the uh, time of arrival of the individual pulses very precisely. And the second uh, quantity entering here, this detector noise, is the root mean square of the timing error. So I want to measure the time of arrival as precisely as possible. And typically, this can be done with a precision of the order of a few microseconds. Um, and then if, if I try to find evidence for gravitational signals. I'm sensitive to a particular range of frequencies in the gravitational wave 
spectrum. So the lowest frequency is given by the entire duration of the observational program. So if I observe for 12 years, I am sensitive to frequencies as low as one over 12 years. And the highest possible frequency is given by the cadence. So if I observe my pulsars every two weeks, the highest frequency I'm sensitive to is roughly one over two weeks. At the moment, uh, such measurements are performed by a couple of collaborations in Europe, North America, and Australia. In Europe, we have the European Pulsar Timing Array Collaboration, EPTA, or EPTA. In the US, it's Nanograph. Uh, Nanograph has recently made some very exciting uh, announcements. We'll talk about this in the last lecture on Friday. Uh, and then in Australia, there's the Parks, PP, uh, the Parks PTA um, located at the Parks Observatory. And if these collaborations join the data sets, this leads to the International Pulsar Timing Array Collaboration, IPTA. And this plot here is taken from some IPTA data set. Okay, so how do we know that we really see gravitational waves in these observables? How do we know that these residuals here contain a signal or some evidence for gravitational waves? Um, and then for this, we have to look at, again, yeah, correlations within our data set. First of all, let's, uh, let me mention a few more details on how you obtain um, these timing residuals. So basically the physical effect is that, or what you have to do to calculate these residuals is to uh, integrate your metric perturbation along the geodesic of the pulses. Yeah? So you take um, the trajectory of the pulses from the pulses towards us uh, and you integrate the metric perturbation. And then you find a term, uh, two terms coming from the boundaries of this uh, geodesic integral. Um, there's one term uh, evaluating the tensor perturbation at earth so there's this little E here, this is called the earth term. Uh, and there's a contribution coming from the tensor perturbation at the location of the pulsars. This is the pulsar term, P stands for pulsar, and D is the distance uh, to the pulsar. And Hij is just a geometrical factor that accounts for uh, the relative orientation of the pulsar and the gravitational waves and uh, the observer. Okay, and that gives us a shift in frequency in the pulsation frequency of the pulsar, and we can integrate this over time, and that then leads to, well, the observable in the time domain. This is the timing residual and tells us by how much the expected time of arrival deviates from the measured time of arrival. All right, um, I said to find evidence for gravitational waves, we have to look at correlations. So now we can take the timing residual of a pair of pulses, two pulses in the sky, and cross correlate the timing residuals. Uh, so we look at this cross correlation for two pulses I and J. Uh, and if you look at um, the definitions on the previous slides, you will see that this is proportional to um, the overlap reduction function uh, of this type of gravitational wave search. Uh, and then this function can be worked out explicitly. It turns out that um, it has some overall and quite trivial frequency uh, dependence. And then there's some function up here, which does not depend on frequency, um, but uh, which just depends on the angle between the two pulses uh, in the sky. All right. Um, uh, the function is written down here in equation 19, uh, where C psi is, is given by this uh, cosine here. Um, and then this correlation among the timing residuals basically follows from the first term here, from the earth term uh, in our timing residuals. The interpretation is that um, the pulses come from all the pulses from all directions in the Milky Way, but towards the very end of their journey, so shortly before they reach our radio telescopes on earth, they have to travel through the same perturbed space-time metric. Uh, they all have to travel through the solar system and are all subject to the metric perturbations inside the solar system, um, and they all feel the same Earth term, this leads to this non-trivial and non-vanishing correlation among the timing residuals of different pulses. Uh, you can plot this curve zeta as a function of the angle here in the, on the left-hand side. And this is the famous Hellings and Downs curve. So this is the theoretical expectation for how the timing residuals of two pulses in the sky as a function of the angle between them should be correlated. This is a quadrupole correlation. It's positive here, 
negative here and positive here and it would be very hard to fake by any other effect that affects these or that acts on these timing residuals. This would be uh, really a hallmark signature of a stochastic gravitational wave background. It has this quadrupole shape, which is induced by the nature of gravitational waves uh, in the vicinity of the Earth, so basically inside the solar system. Uh, and other systematic effects would typically lead to a monopole correlation, something that does not depend on the angle at all, or other effects could lead to a dipole correlation, something that goes from positive to negative. But this quadrupole correlation that goes positive, negative, positive is hard to fake. And this is something like the, the holy grail of PTA searches for a gravitational wave background. And we'll come back to this in the last lecture on Friday when we talk about nanograph. Okay, so in the remaining um, 10 minutes or so, yeah, um, I want to talk about gravitational waves and the CMB. So now we're talking about gravitational waves with oscillation periods of billions of years, basically gravitational waves that oscillate on timescales as large as the entire age of the universe. Uh, and what's exciting about searching gravitational waves in the CMB is that this allows us to uh, take a peek beyond CMB decoupling and look at uh, probe, uh, probe processes at much earlier times than CMB decoupling. Uh, for instance, inflation, we'll talk about this tomorrow and topological defects, we'll talk about this on Friday. Um, so it's really remarkable because now with gravitational wave searches in the CMB, we can probe these early times uh, where we don't have any information in the optical or in the electromagnetic spectrum, just because the universe uh, has not yet become transparent to photons at these early times. All right, uh, and the CMB gives us different um, probes or different observables that we can use to look for gravitational waves, temperature anisotropies, polarization anisotropies, and spectral distortions. And I have one slide for each of these uh, observables uh, individually now um, in the following. Let's talk about temperature anisotropies. So just as a reminder um, that we're all on the same page, the CMB is a baby picture of the early universe. It shows us the surface of last scattering. The last time photons uh, undergo Thomson scattering with electrons in the hot plasma before electrons and protons recombine into neutral hydrogen. And you see this baby picture here, the latest uh, CMB temperature map by the Planck collaboration. Uh, and the CMB is highly isotropic. Um, it looks almost the same in every direction. And these temperature fluctuations or anisotropies are really tiny at the level of 10 to the minus five around some background temperature of 2.725 Kelvin. All right, uh, and we can characterize the properties of these temperature fluctuations, um, not in Fourier space, but because we're talking about this, uh, the surface of a two-dimensional sphere uh, in spherical harmonics space and multiple space. Uh, so we can decompose our temperature fluctuations into spherical harmonics uh, with these coefficients uh, theta L M. And then these statistical properties of the fluctuations are contained in the power spectrum uh, of these multiple moments here in this decomposition. So uh, we can look at the expectation value of, of two such um, theta L M's and that gives us a power spectrum C as a function of L for the temperature temperature autocorrelation power spectrum, uh, the famous CLs for the CMP temperature anisotropies. Uh, and this is what you see here on in the plot on the left hand side. So the CLs times some normalization factor are shown here on the left hand side as a function of the multiple L. All right. Um, and in the theory of CMB perturbations, you can think about different origins, uh, different explanations, uh, sources for these temperature anisotropies. Um, these CLs, they can be sourced by primordial scalar perturbations, but also by primordial tensor perturbations. Um, so the effect of tensor perturbations on the temperature anisotropies is some kind of sucks wolf effect. That means that tensor perturbations can lead to some additional gravitational redshift uh, for CMB photons. Uh, so you see here that these tensor perturbations can in fact lead to a contribution um, to the power spectrum 
uh, of the temperature anisotropies. And the way you calculate this is again in terms of a line of sight integral. So you have to calculate, you have to integrate over the metric perturbation or the time derivative of the met metric perturbation from our position all the way up to the CMB, all the way to the surface of last scattering. Uh, and then if you do have these tensor perturbations, this will lead to some temperature anisotropies. Uh, and then you go through this entire uh, well, chain of calculations and then you find the effect on uh, the temperature power spectrum. All right, so this is how you can try to look for gravitational waves just by looking at temperature. Uh, but um, another possibility is not to look only at temperature anisotropies, but also at the polarization of the CMB. And now the physical effect is the following. Uh, if I have tensor perturbations around in the primordial plasma shortly before CMB decoupling, these tensor perturbations will give rise to a quadrupole temperature anisotropy. And this is what you can see here in this little cartoon. So um, consider some uh, position inside the, in, in the primordial plasma uh, and in the presence of tensor perturbations. The tensor perturbations will lead to this quadrupole anisotropy in the temperature. So around this position here um, in the plasma, you will have some hot spot maybe here and then maybe also down here and then some cold spot uh, over here. Uh, and then now photons coming from the hot spot and the cold spot will scatter differently uh, on electrons here in, in this position that we're considering. Um, so uh, photons with a larger intensity, uh, radiation with a larger intensity, photons coming from this direction uh, will scatter into this direction. And I mean, along this axis here uh, and give us a predominant uh, polarization um, along this axis, which will dominate over the polarization coming from the photons that scattered off electrons at this position and that were coming from this cold spot. Uh, so this eventually then leads to some uh, some net polarization of the CMB uh, photons. Yeah, Thomson scattering results in linear CMB uh, polarization. So we can try to measure the CMB polarization and infer information or find try to find evidence for tensor perturbations that are responsible for creating this CMB polarization. Uh, we can decompose the CMB polarization into two different types of polarization modes. These are typically called the E mode and the B mode polarization. Um, they are not related to the electric and magnetic field in electromagnetism. Uh, they're just called E and B in analogy to electric and magnetic fields because E is defined such that it is uh, curl free and B is defined such that it is divergence less or divergence free. All right, uh, and now you can ask what type of perturbations can source these E mode and B mode polarization. Uh, in the case of the E mode polarization, uh, this works for scalar and tensor perturbations. So we uh, can actually go back to this plot here. Uh, you see the scalar perturbations can lead to some E mode polarization, this green curve, uh, and tensor perturbations can lead to some E mode polarization, so this green curve. Um, however, in the case of the B modes, it's slightly different. Um, on the one hand, okay, E modes can be converted into B modes via gravitational uh, lensing. Um, this is this purple curve down here. So B modes from scalar perturbations, but this is just a lensing effect. And in fact, um, these B mode, this B mode polarization has been observed already here at high multiples by uh, ground-based uh, CMB experiments, uh, polar bear and, and others. Um, but uh, there is no primordial scalar perturbations cannot source B mode polarization. So in this case, it's only the tensor perturbations that can lead to a B mode polarization, which you see down here, this purple curve. So if you find evidence for uh, these primordial B modes, this would also be evidence for tensor perturbations in the CMB. Okay, so if you now combine everything, um, searches for gravitational waves or primordial tensor perturbations in temperature and also in polarization, at the moment, you can uh, put an upper bound on the contribution to the CMB power spectra from tensor perturbations. And this works as follows. You consider the power spectrum of the scalar perturbations, which has some amplitude at the CMB scales and the power spectrum of the tensor perturbations. You look at the ratio of the two. So the ratio of the scalar amplitude and the ratio, uh, the, ra the ratio of the scalar to the tensor amplitude, this is the famous 
tensor to scalar, yes, tensor to scalar power ratio. The, Sorry. The ratio is a- uh, Tensor to scalar ratio. The ratio is a- uh, The tensor should be- Sorry? Tensor, power spectrum should be in the numerator. Yes, I, I, okay, uh, it's, I, I think, I mean, it's written correct, yeah. It's tensor, it is, you're right, this is this is a typo. Uh, I think I said it correctly, but I it's a typo here. It should be tensor to scalar. Yeah, so I want yeah, to put H tensor. in the numerator. Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry about this. Uh, I will fix this. Okay, second typo, equation yeah, second typo. <laughs> 25, excellent. Okay, I will correct this. Thank, okay. th thank you very much. It's, yeah, I mean, it's in the name, right? It's tensor to scalar. I, I just confused myself, but it's tensor to scalar ratio. Um, and if I combine the data from Planck, but also from uh, CMB polarization experiments on the ground, uh, bicep and keck at the South Pole. Uh, the most recent upper bound on R is very small. It's uh, 0.04 already. Uh, this is based on an analysis, Planck plus bicep plus keck, that came out in October uh, last year. So we now know already that tensor perturbations can at most contribute, I mean, they contribute with less than 5% to the shape of the CMB power spectra. Uh, and yeah, here on my last slide, I want to briefly mention spectral uh, distortions. So we know the CMB, uh, the CMB spectrum is the best black body spectrum that has been ever measured uh, in nature. Uh, you can see here the data from the COBE satellite and the prediction from a black body spectrum. It's a perfect agreement. Um, but of course, the hope is that you may be able to find tiny distortions and deviations between uh, tiny deviations from a perfect black body spectrum if you can measure this even more precisely. And gravitational waves can be one possible origin of such CMB distortions. So uh, tensor perturbations in the early universe, they can dissipate and can transfer energy to photons uh, at redshifts of roughly less than uh, 2 million. At these redshifts, less than 2 million, um, the photon number or photon number density is conserved. It's a constant because um, it cannot be changed anymore by, by Compton scattering that would, yeah, that would lead to, uh, that would uh, uh, change the number of photons. It's a conserved quantity at this moment. Uh, and then the tensor perturbations transfer energy into the photon bath. Uh, and that creates a chemical potential for photons. Uh, and chemical potential is mu. So uh, this is correspondingly called a mu distortion of the CMB uh, spectrum. So now the CMB photons are no longer described by a perfect black body, but they're described by a Bose-Einstein distribution with a non-vanishing chemical potential. So here you see it, this is Bose-Einstein with a non-vanishing chemical potential. And you can estimate or calculate the expectation of your chemical potential coming from these tensor perturbations. Uh, in general, it's an expression of this form here. So it depends on the strength of your tensor. And then there's some, some window function um, uh, while well, you can find the exact expression in the literature. Some window function that really captures this physics of energy transfer into the photons um, as a function of wave number or function of frequency. And then you integrate over all the different scales and that gives you a non-vanishing chemical potential. Um, future CMB spectrometers will be able to measure the spectrum more precisely than COBE uh, and will thus be able to put this chemical potential and then also put bounds on the um, underlying uh, spectrum of tensor perturbations. So this is what you can see here in this plot. It's very interesting because this bridges the gap between these cosmological probes of gravitational waves. So these are CMB observations. And the frequency basically corresponds to the current Hubble rate of, um, of the life, the age of our universe. And then at much I mean, comparatively higher frequencies, we have space-based interferometers and ground-based. But just in between at these frequencies between roughly 10 to the minus 15 to 10 to the minus 9 hertz, uh, we are sensitive to primordial gravitational waves by looking for spectral distortions of the CMB. The existing bound from the FIRAS experiment or FIRAS instrument on board of the COBE satellite. So this is not really yet very competitive to these other constraints. But then future experiments, for instance, for instance PIXI or other proposals like Voyager, they will really push the sensitivity and, and constrain gravitational waves here to much smaller amplitudes.
And I think this is very exciting. Um, yeah, so this brings me to the end of the second lecture. Here are my take home messages for lecture number two. Um, the global network of gravitational wave detectors is growing and soon we will enter the era of multi-frequency gravitational wave astronomy. Um, the response of a detector to a signal is quantified in terms of a detector transfer function for just a single detector. And for pairs of detectors, I have to look at the overlap production functions. Um, a cross correlation analysis is a powerful method to, to search for a stochastic gravitational wave background signal with a network of detectors. And we also worked out um, the expression for the signal to noise ratio in such a uh, We found that the optimal signal to noise ratio requires a matched filter, an optimal filter that is based on the actual system. You will have to model this in terms of uh, a template bank and you have to make educated guesses about uh, the shape of the signal. We constructed different types of sensitivity curves. I uh, introduced the effective strain noise for a detector network and we constructed the power law integrated sensitivity curve. I briefly talked about pulsar timing arrays and they seek to measure um, the headings and downs correlation among different pulses or among the timing residuals of different pulses. And this would really be uh, the hallmark signature of gravitational waves in PTR, PTA measures. And I talked about the CMB and the CMB uh, can lead to evidence for gravitational waves encoded in the temperature anisotropies, the polarization anisotropies, in particular the B modes, but you can also look for gravitational waves in spectral mu type distortion. Um, so now today we talked about um, uh, the theory of gravitational waves and we learned what is the exact meaning of H squared omega gravitational wave. Uh, and now in the second part of the lecture, we talked about experimental sensitivity curves uh, in plots of the quantity. So we are all set and then uh, can start to talk about individual sources from the early universe, such as inflation and phase transition and cosmic strings. And this is what we'll do uh, tomorrow and on Friday. But for now, uh, we are done. And this is the end of the second lecture. Thank you very much for your attention. OK, thank you. <laughs> it's very nice. Yeah, thank you. Lecture. Yeah. OK, yeah. Yeah. Now yeah. It's open for thank you very much. Time, so. OK, yeah. <laughs> now it's open for questions. So. Uh, yeah, OK. So we can ask some questions. <laughs> yeah, I can turn down my volume at least by tomorrow. Do we have uh, questions? Are there questions? Okay. A question. Yeah. Okay. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Yeah. Uh, so, so what, what, what limits the gravitational wave frequency, which can be probed by PTA? Uh, what limits the range? Yes. Um, I mean, let me just show a plot of the sensitivity curves. Yeah, I am, I'm also curious in the future, how much yeah, is going to change? I'm also curious in the future, how much is going to change? Yes, um, I mean, you can see a couple of sensitivity curves here. Uh, the frequency range is really determined by the time scales involved in the entire measurement. So mostly you're interested in um, the lowest possible frequencies that you can probe. And this is determined by the entire duration of uh, the measurement. You cannot look for gravitational waves that vary on longer time scales than the duration of your experiment. If a gravitational wave only oscillates every 100 years and you only observe for 10 years, you will not be able to see any indication of that in the pulsar data. Um, so this gives you the lower ante of this frequency uh, band. Um, the, the experiment that has been running for the longest time so far is EPTA, EPTA. Uh, you see this uh, orange or red curve here. They have data for up to 20 years or even a bit more. Uh, so they can go, on, go down to really almost nanohertz uh, frequencies. And if you want to push this further, you have to wait, you have to observe for, for longer periods of time. I mean, here for IPTA for this curve, I have assumed, I think, an observation time of 20 years or a bit more, and also for SKA. Uh, and apart from this, the sensitivity is controlled by um, uh, the, the observation time, 
um, the precision with which you can measure the timing residuals and also the number of pulses. I mean, if you have more pulses, uh, you, you become more sensitive. And that's why for these IPTA and uh, SKA future sensitivities, you always have to make some assumption. For SKA, for instance, I think I used uh, 50 pulses and a timing precision of less than 100 nanoseconds, I think. Yep. And then this gives you this, this uh, large, uh, this, this strong sensitivity to very uh, weak gravitational waves. And, and what, what's the reason why you use uh, radio telescopes? What, what's the reason why you use uh, radio telescopes? Because of radio the telescope? Radio Oh, because, because it's radio, radio pulses. Yes, yes, yes. In the pulses. No, no, no. I mean, um, there are pulses that you can observe in the electromagnetic spectrum. So, for instance, the, if you know the Krebs nebula, the Krebs nebula has a pulsar at its very center. I think this is really the remnant uh, of that supernova that created the Krebs nebula in the first place. And you can observe the Krebs pulsar, the pulsar in the Krebs nebula, in the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, but for these PTA searches for gravitational waves, you're interested in millisecond pulses, and there the dominant contribution to the electromagnetic pulse just comes uh, from the radio part of the spectrum. Yeah, it's a radio pulse. And then you have to use the radio telescopes. So SKA is, is uh, one way forward. Um, you will also be able to use FAST in China to observe pulses, uh, pulses and then the radio pulses from these pulses. Um, and a nanograph has used two experiment, uh, so two uh, observatories in the US, one in, uh, yeah, uh, in Virginia, one in Puerto Rico, the Arecibo, Are, Arecibo, Arecibo, Arecibo Observatory, uh, which has collapsed last year. So uh, they no longer can use that radio telescope, <laughs> but they still have they still have uh, the Green Bank Telescope in the US. Do you also use the, this property of interferometer? Interferometer does not matter here. Interferometer does not matter here. No, uh, I mean, well, you can think of this network of pulses as an interferometer, uh, yeah, but then it's an interferometer basically, I mean, with an extent of several kiloparsec. I mean, the, the point is that, I mean, here at these very low frequencies, you have gravitational waves with very low frequencies. Um, the gravitational waves propagate at the speed of light. So if the frequency is one oscillation in one year, that means the wavelength is one light year. Um, I mean, these are very large gravitational waves. They can extend from our solar system to the neighboring stars. I mean, this is something of the order of a couple of light years. Uh, and you cannot construct uh, an actual interferometer on these scales, but you can use pulses to construct something similar. Okay, okay. okay. thank you. Okay. Yeah, okay. I mean, I, I, sometimes you read that these pulsar arrays that they really spend the entire Milky Way. And I think this is not quite correct. So in these data sets, uh, the pulsars or the pulsar arrays, they typically use pulsars within a couple of kiloparsec. So maybe I think one, two, two and a bit kiloparsec is a typical distance to these pulsars. So it's not the entire Milky Way, but it's sort of our local neighborhood in the Milky Way. Okay. Thank you. I mean, the distance from us, the distance from us to the center of the Milky Way is roughly eight kiloparsec. So it's yeah, it's really on our side of the Milky Way. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so can I can I give you a question? Okay. Uh, can I, can I give you a question? Yes, uh, of so, course. So, yeah, I think I missed the point. So, uh, so yeah, I think I missed the point. So, so stochastic gravitational waves is always there. Stochastic gravitational waves. Can you make sure that our model is flat? Can you make sure that our model is flat? Oh yeah. Um, I mean, we have not really talked about specific models yet. Um, but a stochastic gravitational wave background means that it's always there, just like the CMB, uh, the cosmic microwave background. It's an afterglow of the Big Bang in photons. And these photons constantly reach us uh, in our experiments on Earth. And a stochastic gravitational wave background from the early universe would be very similar. This would also be a background of gravitational waves coming from all directions and reaching us 
all the time, uh, hopefully all the time in, the, in, our, in our experiments and detectors. Um, and well, if you think about different sources, uh, they each give different predictions for the spectral shape. I mean, we have not seen this yet. So uh, we do this step by step and tomorrow we will see a, first, a, few, a few first spectra. Um, then you draw a prediction for the gravitational wave spectrum in these sensitivity plots and each source will give you um, a different spectrum. So in principle, if you can measure the spectrum at many different frequencies or over some range of frequencies, and you can really determine the shape. This shape can be some indication for the origin of the signal. So for instance, phase transitions will give you a, a different spectrum, a different shape than inflation, for instance. So each source gives you a characteristic spectrum. And then if you can measure it, you will be able to distinguish between the sources. But this is sort of a best case scenario. I mean, uh, for this, you really have to, and we have to be lucky and we have to be able to measure the spectrum over many frequencies. And we're not there yet, but <laughs> I mean, many people will hope that this will become a reality now in the next uh, few years and decades. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see, thank you. Yeah, I see. Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I haven't really shown any concrete spectrum yet. So please be patient. Tomorrow you will see more explicit spectra. So may I also ask a question? So may I also ask a question? Yes, of course. Uh, so, so we discussed, uh, uh, so, uh, so we discussed that uh, the stochastic gravitational uh, background will be usually Gaussian due to the number of patches. Number but, of yes. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the but, first question is: Is uh, the first question is, is there a way, or is, is the sensitivity there, there for a gravitational the wave interferometer or observatory uh, that can actually measure the uh, degree, that can actually measure the degree of Gaussianity or non-Gaussianity? And the second question, adding on that, is: If there is a non-Gaussian source. In the gravitational wave, what would that sort of indicate? So, would that be like a like a smoking gun signal that there's been something very exotic or unorthodox in the, let's say, in the inflationary stage of gravitational wave production? Uh, yes, these are um, two excellent questions, uh, and I think I mean both are basically the subject of ongoing research. Um, if there's some source of non-Gaussianity in the early universe, it's certainly a possibility that this leaves an imprint in the gravitational wave spectrum. Uh, and then future experiments such as uh, LISA, they will be sensitive to this amount of sensitivity to some degree. Uh, I cannot quote any um, concrete numbers, so I'm, I'm not quite sure whether this will be competitive, for instance, to other probes of non-Gaussianity. Uh, but in principle, it's, it's certainly possible that you uh, can look for non-Gaussianities in the stochastic gravitational wave background signal. Uh, just to give you uh, one example for how this could play out. Um, so imagine that we have some uh, model of inflation that involves non-Gaussianity, uh, but that also leads to very large curvature perturbations or scalar perturbations. Um, then at, at low, uh, at, at small scales, uh, and then these large scalar perturbations, non-Gaussian scalar perturbations, they have two effects. They can, first of all, lead to uh, the production of primordial black holes after inflation, when they re-enter the Hubble horizon. Um, and then these large curvature perturbations can also source gravitational waves in second order of perturbation theory. So I, I mentioned that uh, at first order in perturbation theory, scalar and vector and tensor modes don't talk to each other. This is no longer true at second order in perturbation theory. So in such a model of inflation that also leads to primordial gravitation, sorry, primordial black holes, you can have induced gravitational waves at second order in perturbation theory. Uh, and then if the underlying model of inflation includes some non-Gaussianities, um, this will affect both the uh, properties of the primordial black holes, so in particular the mass distribution, uh, and also the signal in gravitational waves. And I know many people have studied this. And then you can also hope for some kind of best case scenario uh, that you can somehow probe the mass distribution of primordial black holes and that you maybe also um, uh, detect the corresponding background of gravitational waves. 
uh, and then, then both would include signatures of non gaussianities and if you could correlate this uh, this would provide very strong evidence uh, for some common origin and uh, non gaussianity during inflation thank you very much so yeah uh, i mean what i said about non gaussianity or gaussian statistics is only true to some extent or i mean this is a typical scenario and in many cases if you talk about gravitational waves from phase transitions for instance um uh, you can always use Gaussian statistics um, uh, to very good uh, approximation. Oh, yeah, it's it's a Gaussian signal. Uh, but there are cases like the one I just described, where you really have some primordial non gaussianity for instance, coming from inflation. Uh, and this will leave an imprint in gravitational waves and in all the other observables. Um, I mean, uh, it's certainly a very big challenge to... Uh, to find such a signal and to measure it in different observables, but in principle, it should be possible. Okay, uh, are there more questions? So I think the this, uh, instead of single detector, you propose to use the multiple detectors, network of detectors. So instead, I think in the same spirit, uh, in a similar spirit, you are supposing, proposing the uh, quadruple, quadruple uh, correlations in the case of pulsar timing array. So my question is, the, I think that you have a good shape of the correlation function uh, as a function of the angles between pulsars so is there any current limit on uh i mean the current limit i mean the uh the current sensitivity uh from pulsar timing array uh is there any sensitivity to the shape of this uh correlation function or just do you are uh, counting yes uh this is an excellent question to, you are just sensitive to um, the changing the frequencies you are just uh, this is an excellent question. Um, I mean, until very uh, recently ago, uh, the answer would have been, yeah, there, there's not even any signal or any timing residuals in the first place. So until recently, you would have not been able to uh, put some timing residuals here and then try to reconstruct some uh, correlation. But uh, now last year, Nanograph has for the first time seen actually some timing residuals that differ from the noise expectation, just the background noise. Uh, and now for the very first time, you can actually work with these timing residuals and try to reconstruct this thing here on the right hand side. So this plot here is just a cartoon and then this does not involve any real data, but now for the first time you can do it uh, with real data. And I will show you the plot on Friday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, there are some constraints. Uh, Nanograph has seen something, and I will talk about this on Friday. Uh, yeah. And I, it, it looks okay, but it's not um, conclusive yet. It's not. It's not a proof yet. I mean, there are some constraints. Um, there is nothing that would speak against the gravitational wave interpretation. It's absolutely a possibility. It's mm -hmm. viable. It's a viable option. Mm -hmm. There are some constraints and. We can now we can hope that in the future this will be improved and in a couple of years from now we will get much much closer here to this red curve yeah but you will see the plot on friday ah, okay yeah i'm looking forward to seeing this yeah i'm looking forward to this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, i mean it's very exciting times for pulsar timing astronomy um i think since last year the situation has really changed because now they start to see something um still two years ago and then in all the previous analyses and data releases it was always only um, noise and upper bounds on the strength of the signal. Mm. But maybe now they have seen a signal. But I mean, obviously, there are a couple of open questions and we'll talk about this on Friday. Yeah. Mm. OK, it sounds good. Okay. It sounds good. Yeah. Are there uh, more questions, including the first part of the lecture today? Do you have any questions?
Okay. I think the yeah, your lectures are very clear. Yeah, your lectures are very clear. I think everybody <laughs> could have understood. Uh, could I think that have understood. at least logically. <laughs> Yeah, I hope so. I mean, I said, I mean, please don't try to follow the equations or the calculations in your head. I mean, this is too much. If you want to do some calculations yourself, just take the slides at a later point, at a later stage, and, and then you can flip back and forth and so on. But here it's more about the philosophy, yeah, and, mm -hmm. and the ideas behind these calculations. So, All right, okay, yeah, thank we, you very much. Uh, um, you. Then let's stop here. And right. tomorrow we'll continue with inflation and phase transitions. Okay, sounds good, okay. Okay, see, thank you for your all attendance okay. and see okay, you, uh, see you, for you tomorrow all again. Attendance and see you uh, tomorrow again. Yes, tomorrow at the same time. Okay, okay thank, thank you very much. You. See you tomorrow. Okay, thank bye you. bye.